Hello and welcome to the audiobook of Always the Horizon by Murdoch Murdoch. It's presented to you by Livid Productions, as published by Murdoch Murdoch in November of 2021. A copyright, he says you can do whatever with it, basically, as do I. Disclaimer. Reader discretion is advised, as published on poll. And we will begin with his introduction. First, I just wanted to say, you're all a bunch of faggots. Secondly, I would like to thank Paul and the Forge Sheds community in general. You forever changed me for the better. When I first came here, I hated you. I thought you were all a bunch of mean-spirited racists. LOL. However, in time, I began to understand what you were fighting for. And eventually, I too joined your cause. Do you remember what it was like before, Trump? We never thought we could change anything. We were sure that Europe was lost. But now? Now I know Europe will live. I know that in the end, even if we do not live to see it, the European continuum will live on. To see tomorrow's dawn. I know that a lot of content creators on the internet say that they love their fans. And I know how hollow that can sound, but I do love you guys. You were my comrades in the trenches throughout these turbulent years. You broke me free from their system. You destroyed my nihilism. You helped me once again find God or purpose or whatever we will call it. The whole internet calls you guys the worst of the worst, but it simply isn't true. You were the best of your generations. They call you incels, freaks, and losers, but that is false. You are the few who decided to bravely face the unknown, to ride out into the horizon chasing the sun. I still don't know what those early threads must have been like when you guys were first coming to terms with race realism, sex realism, and the Jewish question. Some say it started around 2008, but we all know that that sacred flame came from communities much older than this anime image board. This little book is dedicated to George Lincoln Rockwell, Savitri Devi, William Luther Pierce, Adolf Hitler, Charles Darwin, Terence McKenna, Friedrich Nietzsche, Abba Akerlund, and all of you fight for the European continuum. Whether your eyes are blue or green, I love you. Even if you're not a white person, or only partially white, I love you. What I've come to see is that it's about something much larger than the white race. This is about whether or not there will be knowing within being. Yes, it's true that through the European continuum there exists the greatest propensity towards knowing, but one does not have to be European to aid that force. That's what you're really fighting for, you know. You built the microscope to look out into the microscopic world. You built the telescope to look out at the heavens. Like Hume, you look towards what we can see. And like Kant, you look towards what we cannot see. Always pursuing the knowing. Always chasing the sun. If Europe dies, and the Semite is made to rule the earth and fulfill his machinations, being will lose its ability to know itself. That's why you must fight. And that is why you, the non-white, must aid the Aryan. That is why you, the young European girl, must make as many beautiful white babies as you can handle. That is why you, my white brothers in arms, must give everything to defend our peoples. Murdoch Murdoch. Chapter 1. The Graveyard Here we sit in the graveyard of Europe. No banner lies untattered. No grave undesecrated. A cornucopia of corpses. Some green-eyed and some blue. And which was the master race again? Who was it that won the most glory-killing white men? These graves have only grown in size, and each new generation lives ever more in their shadow. What do these traditionalists even hold on to? Like a man in despair cradling his dead child, 
Does he really believe his embrace could bring back a lifeless thing? Does he not know that the materialist has disproved magic? And if there were magic, then surely our world would not have met the cruel fate that befell it during the 20th century. Why have you come here, Ryder? To the grave of your fatherland? Have you come to follow me? Know that I lead no man, but if you wish to become my companion, then I must make a single request of you. If we are to take up this task and travel the all too arduous path, then you must promise me that your eyes will remain transfixed, always on the horizon. There we will chase the sun. But of course, that is why you are here, is it not? Surely you must be the child of the gutter, or are you nameless, yet named, like me? It does not matter what we call ourselves, for names and egos are useless where we are going. And our only interest must be in finding the purpose. The purpose, you wonder, is it not obvious? The antidote to heal our dying world. The answer to the riddle of the death of God. Surely you must know of the war the materialist waged against the mystic and his god. The materialist would know triumph, but it was a Pyrrhic victory. With the death of the mystic, and not soon long after, so too, the vitalists. Until the last of the romantics had all but faded, the world became systematized and sterile. It was the heart of a Semitic god that was pierced by the materialist's arrow. For our gods had long been in the tomb, forgotten. In truth, it was only the latest deracination. Should we blame Hume? Should we gnash our teeth and curse Socrates? Or perhaps we should accept that they were merely expressing the most Aryan of all principles to look out at the horizon. Where there was Achilles or Christ, now there lies a tenebrious void. As a result of the loss of objective meaning, we begin to sink into the swamps of sadness by our own volition. A quarter of our kind have become hedonists, and another quarter have become ascetic. Half of them run on mere Darwinian survival impulses with no glimpse into the here and now with no humanity but you must love them all the same writer for our task is to rescue from peril the european continuum look all around you these graves mark the history of this all too impressive animal and its variants this hollowed ground covered in celtic chain mill scythian arrowheads roman legionary scutums and German battle axes will all serve to remind us of our propensity for violence. Know this. You must never shirk from violence or join ranks with a humanitarian who views violence as feckless and unfashionable. Violence has always been the sidearm of the noble. However, this violence must never derive from the wicked and cruel, just as the aim of the Aryan is to pursue the fundamental truth. So too is the aptness for war can only be maximized by a noble pursuit. But look at this field, Ryder. These weapons were used by white men to impale one another. These beings with the same capacity to reason, to develop such lovely arts and novelty, using the same eyes to peer into reality, reduced to maggot feet in their youths. What tragedy it was that we ever branched apart from that initially Indo-European language. Had we only the ability to communicate, had we only an aerial view of our tiny existence on this planet, filled with men and monsters, what fools the Greeks were to butcher such a pristine beauty during the Peloponnesian War. How could the Spartan not admire the elaborate Athenian art and philosophy? How could the Athenian not love the Spartan for his prowess in battle? Were they not the same being who had ventured towards different paths along the horizon, chasing the sun? Look how that conflict weakened them both, even if we peer into the darkest age, the 20th century, when the French, German, British, and more all exhausted themselves in world wars. One must continue to ask, for what? To allow a vampiric Semitic banking system to dominate the planet? For a field of graves and banners that no one will even remember? 
You saw yourselves as flags and countries, kings and borders, religions and economic systems, but never once did you see yourselves as Europe, as beings with a similar capacity to know, to advance the knowing. But all of you, who now lay dormant in the cold earth, were brothers in the apex of the hierarchy of being. We've been blind, Ryder. We have crippled ourselves in the pursuit of primitive patriotism. A patriotism built around memetics that allows for white men to impale white men. What a great flag waving as the naive nationalist firebombs white women and children in our ancient cities. What glory do these primitive patriots seek when they manifest propaganda to convince the German that he is not German? and should not wish to be, but we will force him to be, like a body that wishes to die, but is resuscitated by man's technology, by man's will. We will resurrect them back from the grave. The earth will once more know Rhodesia, the Yamanaya, Dixie, and the Dorian, and they shall know themselves as the Aryan first and foremost. A single banner will fly amongst them, and they will yield to no one. Look here at this grave, Ryder. The grave of a little one of our kind. Her body ravaged by our own technology at the hands of a Mohammedan ghoul. Tell me, how many men that lie here in this mass grave could know she was born in Stockholm from her face alone? Could she not just as easily be from Glasgow, Dallas, Marseille, Berlin, or New Jersey. What a repugnant worldview these primitive patriots maintain to deny the unification of beings capable of such a vital array. For the lightning bolt on our banner will stand on any European soil. For we are not Irish or German. We are not Americans or Canadians. We are a concept, a living ideal. A testament that says that no matter where on this earth these beings stand, there too will we stand with them. And if the German says, I am German first and foremost, and can never fly under any banner but my own, then so be it. Know this German. For even if you gnash your teeth and spit in my face, I will not flee from you. Even when danger looms and the sky turns black with a torrent of arrows and an infinity of bombs, I will stand next to you, sword and shield, shoulder to shoulder, mind to mind, being to being. It is an endless journey that we take up, each generation carrying our banner to the next. That is the nature of the European continuum. We must hold both Sparta and Athens, the farmer and the man of the metropolis, the rich and the beggars, the old and the young, the masculine and the feminine the continental, and the analytic philosophers. For if our aim is true, and we ride straight for the sun, all paths, all philosophies will emerge. The inner world will meet the outer world, for there in the heart of the sun, in its warm embrace, is fundamental truth. They are right to say that we will never know this truth, how absurd that a mere aspect of being would be able to take in the totality of being. Like Icarus, we shall fail in our pursuit. We shall plummet down to the earth from the heavens and break our backs. But even then, as we lay ruined on the rocks, we will still pursue it. Our fractured hands still held out toward the sun. We will seek truth regardless of our capacity to understand. Even if Kant is to say, all that we seek is an illusion, then we shall say, yet it exists, and it must be pursued, for even illusions are in the nature of being. Now, take up your father's flag, and let it serve as your cloak to keep your pale skin from the elements. But remember this, that cross, and those colors, even my red, white, and blue, can all be forgotten. Have you not heard? The age of the traditionalist is over. The conservative is but a mortician in the morgue, a practitioner of the grave, whose job it is to fill the corpse with embalming fluid, to 
present the carcasses what it was and what it can never be ever again. Do not fool yourself, Ryder. We are not conservatives. We do not merely wish to hold on to the heirlooms of our fathers, to sit by idly as our empires are made irrelevant. I wish for us to take and to take without qualms. But the modern man, the conservative, is like a defanged lion who is rendered horror-struck at the taste of blood. A once proud animal now domesticated. In spite of this, if you choose to join me down this path, Ryder, you will become a wild animal again. The wild man of Alexander of Macedon, the hungry lion, you will learn to embrace Dionysus and his chaos, which always brings forth opportunity. For it is fitting that here in the 21st century, in the age of chaos, when calamity runs unopposed, that so too in this time would we see a rebirth of the third positionist, the fascist, and the national socialist, the romantic, and the dreamer of dreams. We should be swift and on our way, for twilight wanes, and if we are to lose track of the sun, we shall only betray our endeavor. Drink up this place, Ryder. But know that nostalgia is a poison when consumed in excess. Take with you your sword before your shield, and your tenacity before your reason. Remember that courage was born in despair. Was it not Merkel who compelled you towards this way? When Hirov was made open like a flesh wound, a hundin at the head of the German animal, who drove mud and sick into the very organs of the body politic. That was what brought me here, Ryder. My spirit and only knew despair when I learned that our heartland would be lost, that Garamania would be rendered null. For the colonies I could bear to lose, their destruction seemed a mere failed project. But to lose the motherland completely? To have the core of the continuum mutilated by genetic warfare, for the death of America was only a corruption of a single branch. But to carve out the very trunk of Europe, it was then that I donned the lightning bolt. A lonely life it can be to hold lightning and chase the sun. It is well for you to remember that on our journey, there will be monsters, which are all too often terrible. But the cruelest monster you will find is the one that you love. Perhaps friends or family have expelled you from their lives because your undertaking threatened their illusions. That is the pain the child of Goethe must bear. How strange it is to live in a time when fathers weep that their sons wish to take up the old banner and mothers encourage their daughters' genetic degeneration. When brother sells out brother for the taste of narcotics, and a generation of children is raised up in the ashes of the apocalypse as communists and capitalists, with no real connection to the blood, when every root is cut and stripped from the tree, still we will love them all the same, for it is our destiny to bear the unbearable, to carry the continuum onward, to whatever end. No step forward should be undertaken until you thoroughly understand our task. It is not to restore Beethoven and the Colosseum, nor to live under their shadow, but to surpass them. We will not tirelessly recall when we were once remarkable. Rather, we shall be remarkable. Do you not see that we must shake off this inaction and venture once more into the wild unknown, such that we too will become wild? At ever greater monuments to our experience remain in stone, waiting to be carved by Aryan hands. We will not be content. We will not sit full and satisfied, wishing to drift back to sleep. We ask that the European animal once again awakens. Even if upon his returning to the conscious world, in his wrath the sky is turned to fire, the seas dry up, and the earth is scorched permanently, even then it will have been worth it for the fields of desolation shall serve as fertile soil. You know all too well that destruction is merely creation, Ryder. Tell them, those primitive patriots, that I am the sacred clown, the great iconoclast of modernity, and I have come to witness blood and chaos, and finally, the regrowth of the European vine. Let the slave world stand aghast as red hats become stalhems. Free yourself, Ryder. 
where the cruel hatred of this slave world bellows forth to reveal your way for you to even be here in this graveyard of your fathers has already marked you to shed tears for the land you cannot return to is tantamount to treason in this late hour now you must bid this place farewell like sailors slowly losing track of the coast for how else can one voyage how else can one follow the sun if they are incapable of leaving their homes truthfully I have given up on motherlands and fatherlands for geographical ideals and absurdities for where my people stand that is my state whether they were here on this mountain for a thousand years or there on that island for two hundred how could land ever be as sacred as blood a cold wind now blows through these half-dead trees this place is no longer safe and we must halt our weeping take what you want from here rider but as you know only your flesh is essential only your ability to manifest and reflect on reality only your elan vital soon the semitic tone will ring in our ears once more this place will fall to darkness and be made archaic all that we cannot carry will be lost to time where there was once civilization there will be ruin legal systems that represented the pinnacle achievements of our kind which has been in the development for aeons will be rewritten by creatures with the cognitive abilities of 12 year olds to think that it has come to such madness hurry and gather your supplies for only a handful that dwell here will follow you and even less of them will know the jeopardy that seeks them in this place in the end the tide of the nothing that great torrent of black will wash away all life that persists decay is a slow process until the inevitable total collapse the women who remain will be absorbed into the afro-semitic amalgamation and the men i dare not call men the cosmopolitan european the eunuch what a friend to the elite he has become these anti-natalists or only their own people these quote-unquote men i get no pleasure from chastising him writer it is a spell that he is under he has not studied our history and what history he has learned was written by semitic hands he believes he is cultured only when he despises our culture only when he declares that he is from the tainted tree that he himself has cut the root by his own volition in the pursuit of social justice and as he does so all the more he falls into dejection i will not lie to you there are many among his ranks who will gnash their teeth and fight to the death all to hide the truth of their slave morality but there is not one you know that has been caught in this spell and yet still a thread of hope for our world has remained were you not there once rider for i was your enemy in my youth i'm ashamed of how long it took me to come into the know but each of us must travel our own path and the ugliness of that spell later only hardened my resolve so love him rider love this fool under a spell for many of them here in the 21st century will hear our call and become enchanted for we romantics are natural magicians i pray your horse is swift for we cannot stay here for too much longer even if our hearts long to bring those will not come you know the danger that makes way so why do you linger here in this graveyard do you think me mad and my answer would be to uproot ourselves completely to cut the final thread to become anti-traditionalist to ask ourselves what good is two thousand years of semitic aryans in the cathedrals what good are fragments of pottery from long dead helenes whom i can never truly know what good is the enlightenment that brings about nothing what good is the omnia when i can only dream of them i say to hell with maintaining decay i look to the future from within it's only there in the inner mode of being that we can finally regrow the sacred vine now i will tie the red white and blue on my wrist and tear a page from darwin and keep it in my pocket finally this here red flag with a black swastika that symbol as ancient as our kind encircled by the white sun that we follow that will be my cloak my seven generations hate me for this symbol but know that the eighth will take up its cause 
But this symbol flown by the adversary of my father's father marked me as an enemy of those who hollow out the eyes of our people. Let it serve as a reminder of my promise to the German. These will be my only possessions. Now, what is it that you will take from this place, Ryder? Know that each item you carry will only weigh you down. You can also remember that these objects serve to warm us in the quiet moments when our eyes lose the sight of the horizon, and we must accept rest. Do not forget that these fragments of our past histories that lie all around you here in this graveyard are only physical pieces of our mimetic history. So much more is written into your blood itself there in the realm of instinct. Verily, I wish not to forget all the footsteps in our journey from beast to man. However, our task is to find the new man. Will you take the coil black snake and yellow as a cape? Is that how you will recall liberty? Or perhaps a 50 pound bust of Socrates on a chain that you can carry around your neck as a means to always remind you of your infatuation with freedom? Will you fill your boots with cement so as to not forget how to create it? As its formula was forgotten in the collapse of Rome, it's still better let us take the whole graveyard with us so that when we meet the new man, we can give him a field of corpses. No, to have our eyes here on the grave fix what it was only obstruct our gaze in the pursuit of what can be. In short, I'm not a man of the West. Western civilization is but a single road on the greater journey. I'm a child of the horizon, a broken remnant of the Aryan, an aspect of being, or as Mussolini put it, a feeling. Yes, perhaps you're right to label me mad to suggest the answer should be cut off the ligament that had become infected. What hysteria to bring a blade upon oneself in the desperate attempt to return to homeostasis. What a fatal action it is to draw a dagger across flesh to remove the rot. You must cut it out, Ryder. Look around you, all these conservatives. Look how they worship a bust of Socrates. Look at how pristine they attempt to keep these flags. What care do they bring to the maintenance of the quaint old English home? But what of the maintenance of man? Look to the deification of this graveyard and its urns. Look how they worship at the stone and iron, but never the blood. I'm not glad that it's come to this, that such times would befall us and that we would only live to see not only our homes taken, but even our memories. Alas, this place I once too called home, a museum of our heritage that's now ablaze, you can desperately try to save what you can. But know this, writer. You and your blood, that's all that must be saved. It is the blood that is paramount, and your most precious possession. It is an error made all too often in our age, that a man's worth is found in his dedication to our graves. That the black is white if he adores our ruins. That the African rebuilds himself into the European only if he can be made to love our corpses. Even the head of these right-wing parties that supposedly speak for us do so like men crossing a frozen lake. Each step placed with caution and fear. Like sailors never coming too close to the sirens for fear of crashing their ship on the rocks. For they must remain electable, optical, I say let us crash that ship. Let us make love to the sirens and sing their song. Do you not know what they sing, Ryder? That Europe is blood. That Europe is a state of being. And it is this song that these right-wing pundits and politicians are all too afraid to hear. To sing. Do not weep, Ryder. There, out on the horizon, we will find that things aren't as aimless as they seem. Whether we are to be deterministic or if we should carry with us free will, I shall hold on to destiny. There is a motivated movement that trembles throughout the eternity of this universe, this realm, this being. If one is to put his ear to the ground and listen carefully, he will hear the trembling of its development, a heartbeat that propels this existence ever towards its conclusion. You will come to know that the European continuum is an indispensable element in this manifestation, but let us save that for the road ahead. We are not ready yet to wield the sacred sword weapon that we must carry into battle against the nihilist, the existentialist, the pessimist, the absurdist, and the undreamer. Let them know that we under this banner have romantic hearts, that we shall meet this suffering, the suffering that has captivated the Buddhist with zeal, with smiles in our faces. For a world without dragons is a world without heroes, and we declare ourselves the protagonists of history, but we ask for suffering so that we may endure it. That we ask for the impossible to surmount mountain so that we may prove over and over again that nothing is impossible. Whether we see the sun or we do not see the sun, we will ever move in its direction with our eyes transfixed, always the horizon.
we will continue with chapter 2, The Inconsistency of Man. You will become a new man when you exit this forest. Just as you are no longer the one who wept in the graveyard, you will become something new again. For you are always in a state of flux. Let us pause at this stream and repose. They say Heraclitus once rested here and declared that no man could ever step into the same river twice, for both he and the river had forever changed. Wizards say that all things are energy and that energy is movement. Democritus posited that reality was composed of atoms. Now I suppose those atoms are always changing too, dancing to the rhythm of time. May I ask a favor, Ryder? May we dispense with these terms? Universe, cosmos, heaven, hell. Let's simply call it being. Perhaps it could be said that even being is in motion. Know this. I'm a pupil of both Heraclitus and Parmenides, for I believe being simply is. Perhaps time itself is an illusion. The change is a phantasm. Yet here we are, both changed men. I remember a time when I cared little for anything but myself. Then there came the time when I only cared for the graveyard. And now, here I stand, as one who only wishes to chase the sun. Have you not changed too? Come, let us cool our feet in the river. How can it be that a man can hold two contradictory beliefs at the same time? Is it true that all is one, or is change the only real consistency? Can it be both? Look there across the river at that old tree. Tell me, how is it possible that the distance between the tree and yourself is infinitely divisible? Is there an infinity between us? Was Zeno mad? Was a materialist in error to attempt to put lines around everything? Have we been going the wrong way since Aristotle? How should I ever know? For I am the fool who is both a student of Nietzsche and Socrates. I am the midwit who can see truths in both the analytical and continental eye. Between Kant and Hume, Ragnar Redbeard and Christ. Even more, here, when we must discuss the topic of race, I again shall be inconsistent, for race, like all things, is and is in a state of flux. I have been untruthful to you, Ryder, for I have maintained silence at your expense. This forest that I have led you to is a maze that far too often leads to brutality. This place can drive one mad, to place brother against brother, and give way to the uncertainty of certainties these fixed lines that we arbitrarily codified into rigid dogma. What is Europe, Ryder? Is it just the Yamanaya? Shall we rejoice in the liquidation of Gaul? Is Celtic blood poison? Are the true godmen the Hellenes? Is the German a subhuman brute who defiled the greatness of Rome? There, see? It begins. The constant cutting of parts like chopping away all branches of a sacred tree, so that only the greenest branch of the tree may reach the sun. You must forgive my tongue, Ryder, for this forest weighs on me a great degree, and I feel that as of late my thoughts are slipping. And each step further that we take into this forest, this maze of the mind, the more I lose my composure. Yet we must answer this question before we can leave. How am I to know Europe? What exactly is the European continuum made of? For the analytical philosophers will not join us on our path until we have answered them accordingly. Is it R1A or R1B? Is it the green-eyed man who is the Übermensch or the blue? Which sets of which genes are required to give us Galileo Galilei, and which to give us Leonardo da Vinci. And between the two, which is the master race? Now let me ask you this, Ryder. 
When the water that flows within the river finally makes its way to the sea, is it still the river? At what point exactly has it changed? Do you understand why I have taken you here? For in our travels we may come upon those cowards of men who will say, There can be no European continuum because you cannot define its edges. Well, perhaps they are right. But I cannot deny what I instinctively feel. But then again, in truth, the German is best, yes? He alone should stand above all. And surely he has every right to eradicate these Italians and Irishmen, for they are inferior. Then again, it must be the Greek who is truly the beyond man. For was it not the Greek who gave us the most exquisite culture? And splendid, for it is settled. We shall exterminate the German and give way to a glorious Greek empire. But then again, I must ask, is the Greek even white? Blast! You see, this forest is a web filled with spiders from the darkest of crypts. Bats and bugs, ravens and dire wolves, this place is no place to remain. Now answer me, Ryder. What is Europe? How am I to know it? What is the fabric of the continuum? What exactly is its material makeup? Or is it possible that there's something else to it? Under it, yearning to make way. They say, there were three great forms that manifested in the development of these peoples. But how long I wonder until they tell me it was nine or twenty. For the wizards can never make up their minds. From what I have heard, they were the Western European hunter-gatherers, the ancient North Eurasians, and the early European farmers. These are the roots of the tree. Where do they come from? What exactly were they before? Inevitably, their origins make their way back into the mist. The mist that encircles men and mankind since time immemorial. Even if our aim is to follow the horizon and chase the sun, some landscapes will always remain hidden. Perhaps it is nature's prudence not to deliver up all her secrets to a single man. So now you must choose, Ryder. Which of the three must be kept and which should be uprooted? And again, must we uproot anything? Can we simply not allow the branches to yearn for the sun on their own? For it is true that all light that touches their limbs only serves to give life to the tree. Yes, perhaps it is your branch who absorbs the most light. Or perhaps it is mine. Then again, I must ask. Are you a halfling, Ryder? Are you a quarter blood? Some mixed up being attached to the European continuum. A hybrid, a mongrel, a, a lost one, of those whom have never even had a grave. For he who has two graveyards but only one body can never truly rest in peace, just as a country between two nations at war cannot remain neutral. These Semitic puppet pundits that claim the leadership of the radical right could only pretend to know my crimson cloak will call you an abomination. And perhaps it is so. However, it is well with me that abominations can join the chase of the sun. For you two have come this far only gives me further hope in the final aim. That the moral framework that we shall establish will exist within the hearts of all mankind. Just as hierarchy is natural, so too is the hierarchy of being, for it is only the obfuscator whom will destroy himself to maintain imbalance. It is only he, that Semitic viper, filled with cunning, who would gouge out the eye of being just to maintain his megalomania. But let us not dwell on him yet, for now is not the time to confront such creatures. Not until we can leave this forest. So tell me, Ryder, who is the Master Race? 
Where does the line begin and end? How am I to know Europe? Now I have it. Let us say that in order to truly be European, one must be 33.33% Celtic, 33.33% Mediterranean, and 33.33% Germanic. Or should there be a leniency of 5% for Slavs? And what of the Anglo? Are they even European? No, certainly not. Yet perhaps they are. Well, in fact, they are the most European. Alas, this will not do. For surely the master race must have a jawline. So we must do away with the Anglos. Let us also discard the Nords, Mediterraneans, and Celts. Perhaps we should cut down the whole tree? Oh, Ryder, I believe I must sit down, for my mind is not well. Surely this forest taxes us both? The mist now makes its way into my thoughts. I hear a thousand voices whispering in the trees. For a moment, I'm a German losing his homeland to the Roman civilizer. The next, I'm a Roman witnessing the collapse of my state at the hands of this blonde brute. Today, I'm the president of Minden, massacred by Catholics. And tomorrow, I'm the inhabitant of Landsberg, decimated by Protestants. And I feel their hatred, Ryder. An old, virulent hatred that I'm not sure can ever be overcome. For a moment I see through the eyes of a Russian soldier on the Eastern Front during the Second World War. I'm taking a woman's body as she weeps. She has my blue eyes. What am I doing? No, but of course, they invaded our motherland. Therefore, every last German must be liquidated. For only when the German is removed will the good earth know of kindness. What does this bitch know of kindness anyway? I weep. Please, Ryder. Tell me there's something more to this than genes and streams. I cannot see when one becomes the other. Where the man becomes sub-man. Where river becomes sea. The language has changed, but the feeling, the deep yearning from the heart of being is there, resonating in their voices. A chorus that cries out for truth in the transcendental. But I see the great impulse in Dostoevsky, and I see it in Wagner. I see it in Martin Luther's desire for man to seek truth by his own volition, rather than mere acceptance of dogmatic systems. Was that not Faustian? There, too, I see it in the Catholic in his cathedrals. Semitic, yes, but under the Jewish characters, there lies the Aryan structure. For the yearning that manifested the Pantheon was the same that brought forth Notre Dame. It was the infinite that compelled them, whether the vector was the pantheon of gods or the eternal one god. It was always that the yearning drove towards the infinite. Yes, of course. This will be our finest clue yet. Suddenly we have clarity. All at once, their chorus goes from dissonance to harmony. A ray of light once again shines through the trees, for the European continuum yearns for the horizon to chase the sun. But of course, it is not only the European who pursues the sun. I suppose there's at least one man who heeds its call in every race. To seek fundamental truth regardless of the peril that may wait. It's been not a quest for the infinite. Did Kubrick? Let it be said, I am a child of the horizon. Any man of any race, even he who is the abomination of race, who takes up this flight towards the sun, is my ally. But know this. I travel only the path that gives rebirth to the European continuum. But in the pursuit of truth, I may find the remedy to rejuvenate our poisoned people. I believe that in my journey towards the sun, I will one day wield the sacred sword. 
so that light can again shine in their eyes. That they may once again pick up the banner with a venerated lightning bolt and fulfill their destiny, for they alone, I believe, are the guardians of knowing, beings seeker, its greatest lens. What am I even saying? They? There is no they. For what does the Frenchman and the German have in common but a heap of corpses at Verdun? Does the child of America, which is an extension of Britain, felt so compelled as to go to war with her over tea have anything in common with its Anglo womb? The British should gnash their teeth and seek vengeance. I can imagine them now. Burning down the White House again, much to the Americans' chagrin. Would it not be splendid? Wouldn't that bring about the Superman? If the Anglo could be compelled into total war with himself, would it not only allow for a higher being? Should they not compete to the death, so as to whittle away the weak? And there's only one left in the end. Then, you shall be crowned a master of race. Is this not the survival of the fittest? And surely, you know, Ryder, survival is everything. Now to hell with this European tree. It disgusts me now. If they were worthy to exist, then they would continue to exist, but look at them, Ryder, my so-called companion. For they have begun to walk hand in hand into the swamp to die out like martyrs in hopes of teaching an African to read our gravestones to hell with all of them. I, the sacred clown, declare war on the European continuum. But no, that's not right. Uh, for there is no European continuum. They are merely an array of biological life forms competing for resources finite resources, which forces on us an axiom of reality. We must destroy each other. We must compete. Why do we feel compelled to stop at nations and tribes? For the nationalist's bloodlust is milk toast. We must seek ever further refinement. Do two brothers not compete at all times? Are they not mortal enemies? First, they must compete for their mother's milk. Then, they compete for their father's affection. Finally, they seek love from the nymphs. And I swear to you, Ryder, my so-called companion, there will always be a Helen of Troy. Men will always disembowel men for access to a womb. Yes, let every brother engage in a struggle to the death, like Romulus and Remus. For are we not here to resurrect Rome? Who are you, Ryder? Why have you brought me here to this place? You knew this forest was haunted, and yet you led me here? To drive me mad? Do you dare stand in my way from finding the fundamental truth? You are a bastard. A subhuman. A demon of the highest rank. Let the world know that I shall run you through with my dagger. For I have a purpose. I must save the Aryan. But now that I think of it, the Aryan no longer even exists. It was you who killed him. You lesser man. You filth. You hated him for his greatness. It was you who backstabbed us just before we touched the stars. It was you who turned our men weak with your impure blood and lack of will. Now, let us cut one another. Let us find the master race. You feel it too, Ryder. Every bump and crash as we tumble down this hill. Didn't you know it would come to this? I'm sure more than one bone is broken in my body, but my hand still clings on to the dagger so that I may deliver its kiss to your throat, and let it proclaim me the God-Man that is here. In this sacred combat, 
that we learn what it means to really live. This is refinement. I am the lion. You are the gazelle. I hate you. Finally, we meet the ground. Our bodies lie broken in the ravine. Still, I manage to stand, for will alone can compel broken limbs to bend to satisfaction. But you, Ryder, my so-called companion, are weak. You are a lamb, my prey. Now you feel the cold steel across your neck. Did you not think that the supreme animal would win? Was it not obvious? Now let this force grow fat off your worthless blood. But then again, I must ask, what if you're the master race and I'm the subhuman? Or what if I seek to defile greatness because I cannot stand being second in the hierarchy of man? What if this is my slave morality? Am I no better than he who would wish to gouge out the eye of being? Look what I've become. The sun has slipped into the night. We've lost our way. No tranquility can be found here. Only the murmurings of a million dead men who died for nothing. A requiem for Europe. A great mass perpetually atonal. Kill me, Ryder. Now, before I change my mind again. For was it you or I who led us to this place? I can no longer remember. Which of us is the sacred clown again? Here, let me place the blade on my neck so that you may press it into my flesh and deliver to this earth the Overman. Do it now, Ryder, my precious companion, my only friend. Tell me, why do you hesitate? Do you lack healthy instinct? Suddenly, I see through your eyes the face of the little one from the graveyard. What was her name? Akerland? Is it her face that answers this dreadful riddle? This question that plagues us so. How am I to know Europe? Can her eyes and smile alone form lines around what cannot be outlined? Yes, of course, Ryder, my eternal comrade. It is in her face. For there in that moment, when I see her bright eyes, I know she is part of me. Even though I am miles away, still I can feel it, even if she was born in Sweden, and I in the United States. Still I can feel it, and there is a whole world in that. There is no systematizing, no genetic analysis necessary. I simply see her, and I know that she is of my fabric. That nature itself imbued species with the capacity to feel the world, not just endlessly rationalize it. Ryder, you beautiful bastard, look. We've cleared the forest. Let us carry this good news with us. Let us tell the other Europeans who wish to fly under this banner. For we, these new romantics, who now walk the earth, hold a young girl's face in our hearts. We see now that race is a feeling, that race is a way of being, that race is a purpose. Yes, the European Continuum, I remember them again, those remarkable ones, for I shall demarcate nothing, I shall not yield to the scientist, the clergy of new. I shall not care if the man of the analytical world understands me, for I see her face and I see my people at once. And for a moment, there is no hesitation. For a moment, there is both a race in flux, but also a race that simply is. Come, let us make way, for not far from here is my old pub. Remember this, writer. Alcohol is the European's health potion. For we must heal after having lost ourselves for so long in those dreadful woods. There in that old pub, we will sit with the vile and putrid, the ugly and profane. But know this, there too lies the mind of genius 
and beautiful rebellion. There in that tavern, which was the forum of my younger years, we shall see the condition we find men of our rank. There, we will heal not only our wounded bodies, but also the minds of our potential companions. Now come, we must drink, for we have conquered this forest of madness. Despite the fact that we have lost the sun today, tomorrow we will again take up the quest. For even though we must endure sunset and night, we will always have dawn. And with the reemergence of our beloved star, we can continue our endeavor with our eyes transfixed. Always on the horizon. Chapter 3 The Old Hub Writer You must forgive me for being so... Well... Brash back there. Or I was not myself. Those woods have a quality of trickery for many men that find themselves in them end up never re-emerging. And those that do are said to never be the same. As if a piece of their humanity was lost within the trees. Let us not dwell on the past, for we both are children of the horizon and must ever look forward. Verily, our hearts have been filled by our love of this people and the movement that lies underneath in the substructure, which compels them towards the sun. But let it be said, it was a single girl who saved us from that madness, a little one of our kind, who graced us with truth in our moment of despair. Ah, we have arrived, and it is just as I remember, a pub whose outer shell is neither regal nor uncommon but whose interior radiates speech in a way unlike any other. For here is absolute free speech. Here, you will find the ugliness and beauty of unadulterated dialogue. It was here that I first found myself when I began chasing the sun. At that time, I was much more of a caretaker of the graveyard, and I carried with me a load that was nigh unbearable. Busts and banners, the paintings and scrolls filled my pockets and made me rigid. For I had not learned of the invaluable nature of my blood. Freaks and saints, nationalists and vagabonds, communists and capitalists all find themselves here. It would be well for you to remember that the selfist is the least deadly creature you will encounter. For here lurks another type whose pernicious aim is in the advancement of the unknowing. An agent of those who have taken up the cause to gouge out the eye of being. These liars of the highest rank whose sole goal is to fell our sacred tree. To eliminate a potential threat, they will argue with you that there is no European continuum, and yet our unification into a single purpose is their most dreaded fear. They say that it is impossible, and that they actively work against what they know is inevitable. It causes them anxiety. Is that not splendid? A time will come where the remnants of the Aryan, the civilized, will band together against the unknowing. On that day, so too will the parasite begin to lose its capacity to feed. This international system of banking and robbery will collapse upon itself. Now, Ryder, let us find a table so that we may smoke our pipes and drink our wine. Here we find ourselves a room of many minds and faces. For I see the atheist, patriot, and the ascetic Semitic Aryan, impetuous as ever, the patriot rambles. Has the sacred clown returned to his senses? Has he come to give his life for America? I look to the patriot who had long forgotten the sun and speak. There is no America. 
for she is but a corpse. Now the world descends on her like hyenas and maggots. Her dying flesh breeds other animals. You have abandoned the hunt. For it was the founders of America who chased the sun. Yet you are still looking back at the graveyard. The Patriot scowls defiantly and remarks. You've joined ranks with the esoteric. You speak of magic and meaning. Do you even care for Western values? You wear as a cloak the banner of an enemy of our own people. What is this roleplay, and how can you not see your own shame? I give no pause in reply. I wear this banner because of my oath to the German, for he has been forced to bear a shame unknown in history. I will carry this mark with him as a means to lighten his burden. It, too, holds a mimetic element necessary in the understanding of our being. The sacred swastika. The Patriot's face contorts in confusion, and he remarks, An Asian symbol? Why not the cross, my son? Interjects the ascetic Semitic Aryan. Surely you know of the greatness of Western civilization. If it is true that you wish to chase the sun, then you must utilize the mimetic system that paved the way for such greatness. The greatness of the microscope, the genius of the laser, Verily, if you take with you the cross, you will chase the sun ever further. I stare at him in silence for a moment, and then I speak. I do not wish to carry the cross any further, my friend. I thank you for your kindness, but I must deny that call. For I have come to love life and reject the concept that is suffering. That is, sin. I have come to believe that one should live his life as if there is no tomorrow but one should drink it in full. The ascetic Semitic Aryan frowns and retorts. I see. You are a hedonist. You lay with whores. You bring about degeneration. My eyes turn to his, and I retort. You, sir, are a hedonist in waiting, standing in line for the whorehouse. Isn't your asceticism only momentary? so that you may achieve sublime immortality in heaven. An immortality of endorphins? No, sir, I am not a child of this so-called West, for the tree is much more than a branch. Its strength comes from its own anatomy. Its strength comes from its own anatomy, not the mimetics that the anatomy produces. And as far as the generation goes, sir, Christianity was Rome's religion at the end of the empire, not the beginning. The ascetic Semitic Aryan replies with disgust in his throat. The Byzantine Empire continued on for... but is cut off when the Patriot slams his fist into the table, <coughs> grabs a handful of my crimson cloak, and declares, Role play! You, the sacred clown, role play! You wear this costume and play pretend. Are you a German in the Workers' Party? My hand on his, I say. Did the Americans themselves not roleplay as Greco-Romans? These Americans and their republic, their deep love for democracy, it is good that man looks ever so often back at the grave to know where he came from and what he is capable of. But our gaze must always return to the horizon. The room fills with silence. And suddenly, a libertarian calls out, Slit your throats, you transvestites, bend the nigger muck! The room erupts into laughter. The Patriot and ascetic Semitic Aryan find their way off. Suddenly, before us lies the Atheist, my old friend. He sits down and says, Sacred clown, my dear fellow, is it true what they say? That you found meaning in a meaningless world? Surely you know that I am a skeptic and have long shed the naivete of religious dogma. Now I require material evidence of your claim. Our drinks arrive in good order, and I reply after I wet my tongue. The material is all around you. One need only to follow its movement. The drive towards complexity, my dear atheist friend. There is where you will find meaning. With a confused look, he asks, Complexity? I lean in as if to tell him a secret, and whisper, Being is generating complexity. 
From the dawn of time, new novelty is developed from within. Don't the wizards say it all started with pure energy? But there, at the beginning, it was hot and dense. As this realm cooled, it gave way to the building blocks of matter. That eventually, clouds of gas gave rise to the first stars. In due course, planets, and then life finally emerged on the scene. From life to at long last, consciousness. But know this, the complexity is but an artifact. It is residue made in the pursuit of its conclusion. The complexity is merely a prerequisite. His confused expression turns to a smile as he bellows out. Prerequisite? Surely you just... You, my friend, sound like some old vitalist. I smiled and looked to you, Ryder, as I make my claim. The modern-day vitalist is like a chicken without its head. He's aimless, and allowing him to live in his current state is cruel. I aim to recreate him. The atheist's smile turns to a snarl, and he utters out. Do you mean to say that the universe wanted consciousness? I set my drink at pause before I speak. Yes. He slaps his leg and begins laughing, saying, <laughs> I see now, you were playing a trick on me. For a second there, I believed you had joined the rank of fools who maintain a teleological view of nature. My eyes remain on his as I reply. No, it is true, for I have joined their ranks. I believe there exists an objective purpose to reality, and I aim to apply this to my blade. For the battle that I must wage against the nihilist, the existentialist, the pessimist, the absurdist, and the other undreamers. The atheist calls out, the nihilist? You are daft, sacred clown. For the nihilist has dominated for a century or more. She is immortal. Do you think you are alone in the pursuit to find meaning? You are not. I long ago pursued the sun and lost my god. I have long sought meaning, but know this. I will never delude myself into believing such nonsense again. You who sit here today would fool yourself into trusting a new dogma. Oh, my dear friend, you must bring agnosticism with you. For any other mindset is folly. We can remain existentialists. We can fight for the European continuum simply because it makes you happy. Simply because it makes us happy. Let it remain subjective, so that I may at least make sense of you. I raise my voice and retort darkly. But it is objective! You are the existentialist at the end, destroyed by that old hag, nihilism. You believe in nothing from the onset, but I, the romantic of this late hour, say that there lies an objective meaning to our condition. We have a purpose, a destiny. We're an aspect of being with the highest degree of complexity. The complexity that takes shape as consciousness, at its apex, and results in the knowing. That is our quest. To pursue the sun! His face now turned pale. He mutters out dolefully. The knowing... I finish my glass and begin again. Being's attempt to know itself. The atheist now pauses as if he is trying to put together a puzzle without enough pieces. He whispers back. You mean that reality is attempting to understand itself? I will not deny that is true. We are aspects of being. And that we do have a curious way about ourselves. But you go too far to say that it has an objective purpose. We're no more than a speck in space, simply inconsequential. Nature cares little for us. Without hesitation, I responded. But that's not true. It appears to me that nature prefers complexity. For never in her development has it been completely lost. It is only generated further and further. Even after the Permian-Triassic extinction event, more complexity came. Even after the collapse of Rome, in time, complexity flourished. I say that this force that exists under layers of being I cannot see aids in this development. That this motivated movement in being was driven not to create complexity in itself, but rather to bring about knowing. This is true, and there may be an element of being that assists the Aryan in his undertaking against the unknowing. For if the Undreamer were to win this war, 
Humanity would sink into eternal darkness. It would fall into a dull and primitive state. Being would lose its greatest lens at knowing itself. The atheist smiles and finishes his glass before responding. The unknowing. So what is knowing then? Something like truth connecting to truth. I place my coins on the table and meet his eyes once more, replying, yes. You see, for all his weaknesses, Socrates is absolutely right to see that the good and truth are connected. From this, we shall build a moral framework for the Aryan, for it is he alone who seeks the knowing relentlessly. It is there at the apex of being that he takes his place as the seeker. That is the name I have given it. The phenomenon that acts as being's greatest lens in the search for that which is. The atheist pauses for a moment, then he replies, I believe you've been chasing the sun for far too long today, my friend. And as a result, have become confused from the heat stroke. The ascetic Semitic Aryan leans into the conversation and with a gloomy expression whispers, Then, there is no heaven for humanity in your religion. When we die, it's all over. What a tragedy. A wide smile draws across my face as I say, It is the chance at life itself, a great journey for which I am so thankful. Even if this is all that there is, then that is more than enough to overwhelm me with gratitude. The ascetic Sematagarian stands in confusion as he replies, Gratitude to what? I embrace him and say, Being! The patriot makes his way over and once again resumes conversation. How can it be that you carry my red, white, and blue around your wrist, and the swastika around your neck, and not know how liberty and autocracy are enemies of each other? I hold out my arm and declare, I wear this red, white, and blue to always remember my fatherland so that I will always be able to recollect that there once existed a state which wished to spread the Greek form across her borders, remind me of my sacred oath, that my people will have every right to claim their weapons and speak free speech, that I may keep safe, liberty, and the individual spirit, even though I am of the vine of Dionysus, I shall keep Apollo in my heart. You are correct to see my inconsistency, for I am man. I am both of spirit and matter, of war and peace. These fluctuations between autocracy and liberty shift organically, depending on ever-changing conditions. At times, the people must become a singular unit, with a unified will, and at other times, they must be free to question, and know their individuality. Endless debate about the size of government is a luxury for easier times. We, who live here, in the 21st century, are in the desperate hour. I embrace the patriot as he stares in confusion and say, Hear me, friend. It is America, who she once was, that is in my heart. That great pioneering people who always looked to the horizon and chased the sun, they will always be a part of me. But there is a new people who walk this earth. The ascetic Semitic Aryan chimes in. But you are a child of the West. I respond with jubilance. And let me be the last son of the West. Let the new child be born under the sun who waves the banner of the European Continuum. Let him hold lightning and take up the new cause. For our purpose is to carry forth the knowing. I now cry out into this beer hall. Hear me, bastards! Once long ago, many of you set out to chase the sun. Here you found yourselves and rested. Too much rest. Here you reminisce over the graveyard and have learned to complain endlessly. You have lost yourselves and have begun to champion Semitic puppets. You fight for your primitive nationalism. You cling to sinking ships. You now complain that there are mountains rather than filling your heart with exhilaration that there are mountains to climb. What a great joy it is that the dark tidal wave of the nothing now descends on our world. What a fantastical, fearful dragon indeed. Do you not realize that only makes the glory sweeter? What a great adventure awaits. Someone in the back yells out. And you'll be saying how fantastic it is when they load us up in camps for our blue eyes and rape our women in our midst. The pub is saturated in laughter. 
I carry my smile through, and when their shouts become whispers, I say, Yes. Even then, I would look out at the sun and praise being. Even if I am tortured and made broken by the villains of this world, I will still hold out my arm to salute the sun and thank whatever it is that allowed me to be, to experience being. The room was made quiet. The ascetic Semitic Aryan meekly remarks, Was it not you, sacred clown, who once came here long ago filled with nothing but relics from the graveyard? Now you come to tell we, the pub, that you know better. This broken formula you call a religion will get you nowhere. The patriot is right to scold you, for you will never have the votes. You cannot even convince us, we who have chased the sun. So how do you expect to entertain those incapable of ontological dialogue? No, you sacred clown are a sad example of a lost child. You've degenerated into racial worship. There is silence. I begin with, It is true that I hold no stake in the survival of the ascetic Semitic Aryan cause, for it only allows the Semites a backdoor into my world. It is true that I care little if America survives the 21st century. Verily, she died long ago. But you're in error when you assume that I worship the race. We, the European continuum, are only a step on the path to the higher man. I worship the totality of being. I worship all that is. However, my task is to take up the sacred banner and aid in the unification of this people, not on the grounds of language and religion, but by a universal will towards truth. Pub remains silent, and I shout once more. We shall ride under the lightning, for that was the weapon of Zeus and Jupiter and Tyrannis, Thor, and Indra, of Perun, Perkunas, Perkunas, that has become wild men again. For you who dwell here, did I not ride alongside you for years? Come with me again. Let us ride out into the horizon. Let us chase Suris, Hyrios, Arina, Verkaseta, Surya, and Sword Invictus. The atheist speaks up. Why exactly is your aim to bring this knowing into being morally bound to you? Do you once again believe in objective morality? As I've already said, yes. It is simple. That which advances the knowing is good, and that which retards it is evil. All of us are already born with this moral understanding. A deep desire to maintain life. We already know that beings with a higher capacity of knowing are more precious. Just as a child is more precious than an anthill, there is a tremendous instinctive value of sapience. Just as Viracocha willed lesser men to build civilization by his guidance, just as great leadership results in survival and flourishing, just as the societies that allow for wonderment and the advancement of the knowing always grow to master their world with the utmost innovation, just as the Europeans subjugated the world in the 19th century with his advanced technology. A Luddite from the crowd calls out, You're a transhumanist then? You worship technology? Do you not realize that technology is the enemy? That through this industrial revolution, we have destroyed the earth? I turn to him and speak. Brother, if you wish to destroy technology, then you must destroy the Aryan. If you were to take all that he currently knows and burn it up with the Library of Alexandria, he would at once take up the task of its rediscovery. It is his most natural impulse. Besides, if one wishes for an Earth in which these hominids are capable of advanced technology, then he should join ranks with the Semite. He wishes so eagerly to drive mankind into a primitive form. Yes, surely the greatest means to destroy your nemesis technology would be to convince all Aryans to merge with the African, for then you will have your wilderness everywhere. The Luddite is made silent. I begin again. No, I am not a transhumanist, for the blood is sacred to me. Here I say, we all feel the pain together when we hear of a child's death. We're forced to reflect on the loss of her potential. We yearn for them to be and to experience, to aid in the knowing. Remember this, for there are many ways which the knowing is made. 
It was there when man first peered through the Hubble telescope, and it is there when one looks out at the sunrise in awe at the majesty of being. We, the New Romantics, believe that life is beautiful in all its variation, but we too know that it is a hierarchy based on knowing. There is a deep impulse in the heart of every Aryan to wish to live in harmony with nature, that the entirety of the hierarchy of life is to be viewed as a precious gift. This is why we wish to maintain the wild, keep the forest and jungles, so that the world will be a cornucopia of colors and sounds. However, it is our chief duty to aid whomever is the seeker, being's champion, so that the knowing can extend outwardly and inwardly until nature is satisfied. For an existence in which there is no knowing is an existence without beauty. What is beauty but the reflection of being on being? A long pause as members of the pub looked back and forth. Some stood processing. Others waited to see the consensus. Then suddenly the Patriot began to laugh. And slowly, one after one, the members of the pub laughed. Some still stood processing, but laughter won out. This place was once filled with men who swore an oath to the European continuum. Now they only wish to preserve its memes, to confirm over and over where it all went wrong, to argue until the sun sets for good. Come along, Ryder. I'm finished here. I'm not sure how many will come to join us in time, but I hope that at least one was swayed to our cause. The wine will serve well to keep our minds off our wounds until we can reach the Lagoon of Nymphs. For there, they will heal our flesh and make us ready with sex magic and the ideal. It is there that we will seek aid from Aphrodite, their queen, who will bestow upon us esoteric knowledge of the courtesan, the muse. Chapter 4 Aphrodite and the Lagoon of Nymphs. What? I shout to the weeping nymph. She, like all the nymphs and fairies in the lagoon, was in a state of mourning. The nymph, broken and dispirited, looks back up to me and with little voice says, It's true. Our queen, Aphrodite has been kidnapped by the Semites and their underlings. It is said they keep her prisoner in two towers. But they change where she's forced to sleep once every other night so as to hide her location from would-be heroes. I reveal my dagger and say, We are would-be heroes, and we are enemies of the Semite. It is your queen, Nymph, who holds a key to the revitalization of my people. My companion and I shall go to those towers and free her. In an instant, her face turns from sorrow to joy. We're smothered in kisses of fairies and nymphs. Our wounds are no more. It is sublime healing. Know this, Ryder. It is good that these national socialists, fascists, and third positionists are so keen on the role of motherhood. It is certainly best that society yearns for virgin brides and busy mothers. However, there is a weapon that has been removed from their arsenal. This sexual element that is so necessary to heal and compel men shall today be reclaimed. Surely you know the power of the muse. She is the companion of the artist, and without the artist, we cannot win the hearts of the people. Let these moralists gnash their teeth, for we, the romantics, will give rebirth to her. That sweet name, her divine figure, her healing touch, her mystical sexual energy. We finally make our way to the courtyard of the first tower. This place is covered in fragments of Parisian marble. Half smashed statues of the female form. Look, Ryder, these sculptures were taken from the Lagoon of Nymphs. There must be over a thousand here that lie in ruin Suddenly, we spot a young man, not over twenty, wielding a two-handed hammer. He is clothed in ascetic Semitic Aryan attire. He is blindfolded, and aimlessly moves about. 
Without warning, he lifts the great hammer and brings it down on a statue, shattering it on impact. My eyes widen, and I suck air through my teeth as I let out. Boy, what are you doing? He pauses as he speaks. Well, hello there, good sir. I'm working on ensuring my immortality. Confused, I ask. Immortality? He smiles and begins. Yes, sir. I'm fighting against sin. I am in the business of slaying wicked serpents that act as temptation. For I'd much prefer immortality of pleasure than an immortality of pain. I pick up a piece of the marble debris and remark, Who has told you such nonsense? Boy, take off your blindfold and analyze your actions. He jumps and states, oh, But sir, I can't, for I must have faith. Were I to doubt and remove the blindfold, then surely the Demiurge, our Lord Divine, would smite me. Flustered, I let out. Why would he smite you? He gives no pause, and with a great smile says, oh, Because he loves me. I halt for a moment as I process his statement, then remark, Because he loves you? Boy, you do not smash serpents in sin here in this courtyard. Rather, you have destroyed countless works of art that are a representation of the female ideal. What you wish to destroy and call temptation, I wish to preserve and call a work of beauty. He lingers in silence as he grimaces in concern. His hand touches the blindfold and he remarks, I'm sorry, sir, but I've been told by a very knowledgeable priest that upon my viewing of the wickedness of the female form, I will get... He pauses for a moment, then lets out. Urges in my nether regions. I remark without hesitation. Your nether regions? He shifts his head to the side and states, You know, no cock and balls. I hold back my laughter and speak. Your cock and balls. Boy, do you not know that nature saw fit to give you such urges, so that you can go about cultivating the tree of life? Her divine form is not one of sin, but one of sheer grace. Now remove that blindfold and look upon your works. With a continued look of gloom, he remarks, But I can't, sir, for I fear that my loving God will smite me, that he will torment me endlessly for finding pleasure in such things. And if I should remove this blindfold and give up my faith, I would be forced to burn for an eternity in a lake of fire. The boy brings his hammer up once again, but before it can be brought back down, I seize it with zeal and state. Then it doesn't sound like your god is very loving at all. However, there is a love goddess who has been kidnapped by your associates. I must have her to give life back to my people for I need Aphrodite to assist me in my scheme of things. The ascetic Semitic Aryans and their priests have long mutilated our world. Even here, in this courtyard, their machinations bring ruin. I call you a sinner boy. I call you a heretic. For it is you who wage war against the beautiful, so that you can attain an immortality of endorphins. It is you who are the serpent. Now remove your blindfold. He stands in shock and whimpers out. I can't. I begin with, Is it not said in Matthew 5.29, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out? Here, boy, I will give you my dagger, so that you may cut off your cock and balls. Surely, then, you will not have to fear the retaliation of your loving God. He whispers, My cock and balls. I remark, Yes, for surely a lifetime without your nether regions is worth an immortality of endorphins. Is it not said that your loving God forgives all things? Then take off the blindfold, just this once, and see the world from my position. If you see serpents here, in this courtyard, then by all means put the blindfold back on. However, if you see beauty, then let your eyes be free of it. For the rest of your life, he pauses and slowly removes the blindfold. Suddenly, we see blue eyes. His face changes from fear to sadness as he remarks, This is what I've labored so hard to do, to destroy such pretty things. 
falls to his knees and begins to weep. I move to meet him and say, Boy, know this, for all men are forgiven when they resolve to remove blindfolds and chase the sun. He forgoes weeping as we embrace. No longer an ascetic, semantic Aryan. Now he was only Aryan. I speak once more. Know this, I am the sacred clown, and I command you to return these statues to the lagoon of nymphs. Now tell me, where is Aphrodite? He whimpers out. Yes, of course. Thank you, sacred clown. But I'm sorry. The queen is in the other tower. There with the Semitic hobgoblin. The pornographer. My eyes squint and I gnash my teeth. I tighten my grip on the dagger. Come along, rider, for we must be swift. Every moment that we linger here is a moment the queen of nymphs is defiled. We arrive in short order at the second tower, the lair of the Semitic hobgoblin, the pornographer. This place is full of cages and melancholy. The creature sits on a pile of chicken bones, its disgusting habits on full display. Its head dwarfs the rest of the body, and is set with beady eyes, and a nose like a hook. Belching and wheezing, it eats away. Though the top of its head is mostly bald, the rest is littered with oily hair running long on each side. It dons a little hat on its head, but rest assured, it is an atheistic Semitic monster. It is no concept of divinity. It exists to bring about the unknowing, for reasons I cannot understand. There it lies, devouring its chickens on golden plates with golden forks on a golden table. Its limbs, thin and rarely used, lie shriveled on its fat body. Upon seeing our arrival, he stops eating and at once greets us. Welcome, welcome. I see you are here to shop my wares. What pleasure do you seek, my hiddenest fellows? For here at this tower, we offer all types of sensual delights. It clasps its hands and suddenly, the cage with the nymph drops from the tower. It begins again. Perhaps you are here to whip one of these things. To wreck her body, to aid in the defilement of her form. Do you wish to see her lie with animals today? For surely that is the greatest defilement. Is it not also true that the greatest defilement leads to the greatest orgasm? <laughs> it laughs and wheezes. There is silence. Its smile fades for a moment as it looks us over. It pauses with a worried expression. Then the smile returns as it speaks. I see. You're here for the true defilement. You seek the reduction in capacity, the blinding. You wish to see her lie with the subman, as to create subhumanity. You, sir, are a true connoisseur of defilement. We say nothing. Its eyebrows raise, and the worried look returns. There's a long pause. Suddenly, it begins to laugh and wheeze. It slaps its leg and begins rummaging through its collection. Finally, it lets out. Of course, of course, you seek out for more defilement. I have many wares. Here, yeah, look. These two are brother and sister. It is their copulation that brings the greatest orgasm, surely. Yes, it is their fusion and the breakdown of the tree of life that is so sensual, so erotic. Do you wish to see her eat excrement? Bile? There's no limit to the defilement we can bring to her. Still we say nothing, for I have told you, and will tell you again, Ryder. You must never speak to the Semitic hobgoblins. For long in our history, our men would seek logic and reason from them. They would engage in long, drawn-out dialogue that would never be fruitful, for they believed that creatures such as these desired truth, and that somehow truth would find its way. If only we could understand one another. Know this, Ryder. There can be no understanding with the Semitic Hobgoblin.
Let it be said that there have always been prostitutes, street urchins, and courtesans. They are as old as our being, older than civilization. They serve a function which we have forgotten. The ascetic has been taught to hate her, and the hedonist has been taught to debase her. I believe there must be a way to revive the temple prostitute, to give rise to a courtesan who exists to raise the spirits of men, so that all men can embrace beauty in their lifetimes. That these nymphs will be trained in the art of healing, for she, the courtesan, is the natural cleric and ally of men. This is something that has been forgotten for 2,000 years in our realm. It is with the love of Aphrodite that we will resurrect it. But this creature, the Semitic pornographer, brings about an outright mockery of such things. This hobgoblin exists simply to mar beauty, to negate vitality only once this creature, this pornographer, is cut down will we remember the other half of woman. She is both mother and sex goddess. Only then will we have balance. The creature's lips tighten and curl inwards, and wrinkles form on its brow. It finally lets out. Why have you come here to say nothing? Are you not here to engage in the defilement? Suddenly, a gust of wind brushes my crimson cloak aside, revealing my hand on my dagger. Its mouth falls open, and it cries out in fear. I see, I see. You are ascetic Semitic Arians, and you've come to punish me for my wares. Yes, now I see the error in my way. Now I've decided to become an ascetic Semitic Arian. I now wield the cross. I have been saved. Yes, for forgiveness surely is the greatest element about my newfound religion. Come, let us rejoice that I have been saved. I am Converso. Our blade slowly unsheathed. The sound of metal unleashed saturates the area. The Semitic Hobgoblin's eyes begin to widen, and sweat pours down its face. It shakes ever more wildly, for this creature has no instinct in the art of combat. He's lived 2,000 years as a parasite, never defending his home with the spear, but only with the coin. What kind of soldier does that breed? What does he know of warfare? The creature desperately cries out, Put away weapons, brothers, for we are all children of God. For we are all ascetic Semitic Arians. Converso, converso, now let us forgive. Finally, I speak out to the monstrosity. We are not ascetic Semitic Arians. We have come not to forgive, but for retribution. In an instant, we launch ourselves at this monster. Pornographer, our guile and cunning carrying our blades forward, ever to their target. Remember this, Ryder. The first strike is the most important, for if it is executed with sufficient will and precision, it can fell even a titan in a single blow. We move faster than sound, but I see the full change in the Semitic Hobgoblin's eyes, for when I first leapt, its face was of fear. But in the end, I think it was more of surprise that it could not believe that there now existed men who could not forgive, that these new men who now walk the earth would forever seek its total annihilation. Finally, our daggers reached their target. Fourteen times I stab it in its belly, eighty-eight times I stab it in the back. I cannot help but wonder, is this the first time you've been in this position, Hobgoblin? Is this the first time you've felt the dagger in your back? I shall name this strike Toledo, and this strike Dresden. With each cut, hot black tar and pulsating, organ-like coins spew out onto the ground. The creature writhes in pain, 
squealing like some demonic pig. The Semitic Hobgoblin does not abstain from eating pork because of cleanliness. No. He abstains because it is an act of cannibalism. He is the king of pigs. He reveres filth. Verily, I do not do justice to pigs, for pigs have their place, but hobgoblins? They shall have no place. The nymphs are made free as the creature gives out its final whimper. We search the courtyard and throughout the tower, yet still there is no trace of Aphrodite. Suddenly, my heart sinks at the thought that she has been completely blighted, that somehow, between the ascetic and the hedonist tower, she had been lost, both forgotten and defiled. Ryder, without her love, can we guide the nymphs? Will the artists have a muse to stir their souls? We must now return with empty hands. We will tell them of our shared misfortune. Surely we will all weep together at the death of love. On our way back, we encounter once more the young man from before carrying a statue named Hypatia. We greet him as we make our way down into the entrance of Aphrodite's old home, the lagoon of nymphs and fairies. We wear melancholy on our faces like a mourning veil as we drift into her domain. As her creatures ever gather around us, I speak out to them. I am sorry, my beloved fairies and nymphs. Your queen is no more. The light of beauty and the feminine ideal has been lost, I begin to weep. A nymph embraces me with warmth and says, You silly mortal. Do you not realize that you have freed our queen? That you carried her back with you in your hearts from those dreaded towers? Do you not realize that the feminine ideal can never die as long as you men desire it? As long as you are willing to cut down men and monsters for it. Now quit your weeping and look up high above this place. For she is with us now. Even as we speak. I look up and I hear a word on a wing. There she floats, perched above, bathing in the light of the sun. In all her glory. Her red hair, ivory skin, and smile that can heal even poisoned wounds gleaming like a beacon of vitality. She is Venus, Priya, Freya, the inner mode of being's feminine ideal. Her nude form covered by a diaphanous dress of white flowers. Suddenly I am lifted into the air by the tiny hands of a thousand fairies. Slowly they fly me upwards towards this symbol of the ideal, this keeper of the muse. For here, in this garden of love, we are reborn. We have cast off these extremes that the Semite so readily abuses us with. All at once there is balance. The fairies bring me ever closer to her. As we finally embrace, I whisper, Sweet name, you are born once again for me. We kiss. Now, Ryder, I do not know if I believe in Nietzsche's eternal recurrence, that we live these lives over and over, an endless dream we experience in a loop. Perhaps it would be best if it is true what the school of Parmenides would say, that everything is a fixed state. I'd like to think that here, in this moment, when I embrace her, I embrace her forever. Chapter 5. Reckless Abandon and the Inner Mode of Being It has been many moons since we last lay with Aphrodite and her nymphs, yet their glow still resonates on our skin, keeping us warm for a little while longer in an ever-darkening world. Rejoice and be glad, for we now hold the sacred muse. Keep her safe, always close to your heart like a priceless medallion, for it is her body, the vessel of life, 
that can compel men to do reckless things. Know this, Ryder. Recklessness must be embraced, for it will prove an invaluable asset in our undertaking. I plan to guide you through the mountains of circumspection. A storm brews ever more that way, and I hope to arrive when those forces collide. For we will need the danger of the mountain and the storm's vicious heat to create the proper training ground. There, we will learn how to wield lightning, how to move without fear. We will endeavor to release the primal aspects of the Aryan that have long lain dormant. Fate saw it fit that we should find a quaint town here at the base of the mountain range. Let us enjoy their well-cooked food and hospitality before we throw off our civilized courtesies and once again become beasts. The smell of cooked meals, cakes, and bread fills our sinuses. The sound of children laughing gives us respite from these horrible monsters we must endure out in the wild. This place would be a good home if our kind could still have homes, if we had not been forced to become rootless with those who wish to gouge out the eye of being. Here, men labor in factories, cogs in a machine, to the rhythm of the assembly line. Cars whiz by on busy streets to the signal of the lights and the clock tower above always serves to keep order. Whistles and bell chimes, all are utilized to coordinate and instruct these happy people towards societal stability. The women wear pretty garments adorned with plastic gems and paper flowers. The men don hats in many styles and sizes. A courthouse sits in the middle of the town as a constant reminder of the rule of law that one must remain obedient, here in the domain of man. Look, Ryder, there appears to be some type of traveling zoo. They have animals from all over the world here. Elephants and giraffes, tigers and antelope, would pass by a small showcase of various kinds of wildlife. There, a man with a large hat lectures the crowd about the names and habits of numerous species I see an eagle on a stand, and beavers in a small cage on the floor. I turn to the man who owns the display and say, Are these beavers from a nearby river, sir? We soon will make our way up the mountains, and we will surely need a water source. And he turns to me with a smile and says, No, friend. These beavers have never even been in a river. They were born in captivity. Must have been their great-grandparents or thereabouts who were first caught. Same with this eagle here. I had its wings clipped soon after it was born. All my animals are perfectly safe. None of them have ever seen the wild. I pause for a moment and then respond. Safe. Yes, of course they are. Ryder. Look at this eagle with clipped wings. I wonder, does he dream of flight, even if he has never known it? I'm sure he wouldn't be able to understand the hidden desire, but there must be some kind of longing when he looks up into the sky. If we were to purchase these beavers here, and then release them to the wild, what do you think they would experience when they first met a river? What would they feel when they first encounter twigs and all the various necessities to build a dam? Ryder, I must ask, if we too have been in a Semitic zoo all this time, what will we feel when we seize the lightning again? Will there be some type of genetic response? A manifestation of an inner desire or impulse that will force its way to the top. Is there such a thing as a mimetic key? For if the cool water of the river 
and the twigs themselves are enough to compel these little creatures to build great structures, to unlock hidden potential. Then what will we be compelled to build when we find our mimetic keys? The mimetic keys are the cultures and environments that are formulated in unison with our inner mode of being. They take shape as systems, symbols, and objects which all serve to unlock our hidden potential. It was Plato who sought the mimetic key that would usher in the perfect political system. The drive to create the perfect government is an endeavor to find the mimetic key that is long developed alongside our inner systems. This key is interwoven within the fabric of our being. It is in harmony with our way of life. A mimetic key can only be forged in the fires of naturalism. Thus any system that is built on falsity will inevitably break down, and the yearning from the animal will return it to a mimetic key more fitting the totality of its developed instincts. For we, the Romantics, National Socialists, fascists, third positionists, and dreamers of dreams, desire political systems that are fundamentally in balance with our inner drives. These mimetic keys exist everywhere. Jung wasn't wrong when he emphasized the importance of symbols. It was with this mindset that we hoisted up the black banner with the lightning bolt, for it was the color black that symbolized our conviction to neither give nor accept quarter from these creatures who wish to gouge out the eye of being. We brought with us the lightning bolt, for it had long been associated with the champions of the old gods. We wish to prove Savitri Devi right in the end, that when the Aryan's retribution commenced, he would ride with lightning. Our wings were clipped long ago. We have no mimetic key handed down from time immemorial that we can rely on. Our fathers were capitalists who sold out their nation for benefits in leisure time. Our grandfathers aided the communists in devouring half of Europe. Our great 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 grandfathers fought a war to emancipate the Negro. 1700 years ago, Constantine, curse his name, undid all of the steps undertaken by Diocletian to hold on to the mimetic keys that the Romans had venerated since their inception. Did these so-called Romans not realize that every step further from Mos Miatum was a step towards losing themselves? Let the Mohammedan ghoul shit and piss in the Hagia Sophia. We should level Constantinople completely. We should endeavor to build an even greater city there on the Bosphorus, and it shall be named anything but Constantine. Come along, Ryder. I grow weary of watching these caged beings. A gentle rain begins as we make our way up into the mountains. Mist becomes ever more present the higher we rise. Ryder, before we reach the peaks and engage with the storm, I must tell you what I hope to find. I believe there lies a mimetic key in the lightning which comes our way. A key which unlocks a certain dynamism buried deep in our core. Late one night, many moons ago, as Aphrodite lay her head on my heart, she whispered to me, Love can only reach its crescendo with reckless abandon. In confusion, I asked her what she had meant. And she explained, One must make themselves vulnerable to truly be loved, for love is a dangerous gamble. One risks their whole being in hopes of a union which may or may not withstand time. One can build a wall to guard their weaknesses, but only when they are told they are loved, in spite of their insecurities, will they ever truly feel cherished. This reckless abandon that Aphrodite spoke of, does it provide a clue to one of our missing keys? The Greeks held that between recklessness and cowardice was courage. 
that courage was a virtue because of its intermediate location as this golden mean, that it was neither excessive nor deficient. At the risk of being scrutinized by the Aristotelian, can it be said that recklessness is a virtue as well? Verily, it was courage that compelled Alexander of Macedon to unite Greece and make war with the Persians. However, it was reckless for him to lead the cavalry charge at Issus, which pierced through the Persian line. Tell me, was it not recklessness when Napoleon Bonaparte, desperately trying to inspire his men to attack, seized a flag and stood in the open under fire there at the Battle of Arcole? If recklessness is not a virtue, then why do the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end when I think of such feats? Can it be said that courage is not enough? For what is courage but a man's ability to control the fear within? to hold back anxiety and do what is necessary. But is it possible a man can be without fear? When the ancient Germanic warrior gave his life for his people on the battlefield, did he do so holding back fear? Or did he die with satisfaction? Truly the materialist, the man of modernity, will not comprehend such things. For the Germanic warrior believed in an afterlife for those who displayed prowess in battle. Who can be said to still believe in the meme of Valhalla? Perhaps that mimetic key has been lost to time. Yet I still believe the inner drive can be unlocked. We must merely forge a new key. If love can only reach its crescendo with reckless abandon, then let us become reckless. For it is the European continuum that we love, that we cherish, that we could die for, with satisfaction. Let it be said that the new man will not die for his own immortality. Rather, he will live for the continuation of being's drive towards knowing. He may rest satisfied on his deathbed, safe in the knowing that he took up the task to aid truth's pursuit of truth. Being's understanding of being that he and the romantics of the European continuum shall chase the sun with reckless abandon to whatever end. The storm comes finally upon us, just as we arrive at the peaks. It is here that we must learn recklessness. Lightning flashes in the distance, and the wind howls like some mad pack of dire wolves. Here we must capture lightning with our own hands, it is only when we wield the lightning bolt that we can unlock our true potential. Just as those endearing little beavers had to touch the twigs to build the dam, we must touch the lightning to become the new man. A flash of light appears, far off at another peak, followed by a roar of thunder that deafens our ears. I wonder, Ryder, how are we ever to capture it with our bare hands? For surely we must be careful here in this rain and fog. If a single step is placed in error, we would be dashed on the rocks below. Lightning strikes nearby, and yet I am too slow. I pay too much attention to each step, and caution dominates me, paralyzing my abilities. Unless I am absolutely certain my footing is firm, I cannot move. This inaction is a weakness. The root of it is fear. For the storm, too, has a lifespan, and in time will fade away. Unless we are quick, we will lose our chance to capture the key. Do you think me mad? That I could slay hobgoblins with ease, but these heights garner fear within me. That I could drop daggers with a smile against monsters who wish to gouge out the eye of being, yet a mountain stroll during a light shower brings forth terror. Ryder. You must understand, even sacred clowns can have a fear of heights. Know this, the Semitic Hobgoblin is unnatural and thus waging war against it can only bring joy. It is perverse to respect the Hobgoblin in any capacity. However, this storm and these treacherous peaks are a natural phenomenon which must be respected. 
Once again, a bolt strikes close, but still out of reach. The mist surrounds us completely, as gusts of wind and rain shed away our resolve. What has happened to us, Ryder? Are we domesticated wolves? Has civilization filed down our fangs? Is the greatest hallmark of civility fear? How can we become like the ancient men who could die with satisfaction? How can we rid ourselves of this fear? A great flash saturates the landscape, and a bolt manifests high in the air before my eyes. In an instant, I see the face of the little girl from the graveyard. What was her name? Akerlund? Who is to blame that she is no more? Is it the Mohammedan ghoul who drove the vehicle which disemboweled her? Is it the Semite who brought the Moslem in? No. It is my fault. I am to blame. It is fault of the fear that keeps me in captivity. Suddenly, I feel a deep hatred form in my gut. A hatred of my fear, of my weakness. I see the little girl smile and I hate even more. The hate overwhelms me, filling me and eventually spilling out until nothing but hatred remains. Know this, Ryder. Hate is born from the womb of love. They are intrinsically connected. Does the mother not become wild when her young are threatened? Does she not defend them with reckless abandon? For that which wishes to destroy what you love must be met with hatred. There in hatred lies the chaos of the wild man. For the man who hates no longer fears rules, civility, and regulations. He no longer fears death. In an instant, I leap out into the mist and grab hold of the lightning bolt. In a moment, I am made part of the storm. That the heat of the bolt matches the heat of my inner ferocity. The will of Ixion stops as I stand above the clouds, wielding the weapon of the old gods. I have become wild. Not even a godman can counterman gravity. Once again, the fear finds its way back into me as I begin to plummet down into the mist. I wonder, Ryder, did you leap out and touch the lightning too? We are separated, but you need only listen for my laughter as you make your way down to the rocks below. It is my joy that will guide you. The mist fades away as you approach the base of the mountain, and, and finally we meet once more. There you find me hanging, tangled up in the tree. It appears to have caught my fall and I've made some friends. I shift over and reveal baby birds in the nest. It is well and good that fate saw it fit to see that both these baby birds and I shall live another day, that we shall both be given by grace the means to continue our endeavors. I can barely hold back my laughter, Ryder. How silly was it for me to believe all mimetic keys could be found within a single day, from a single action, but know this, for a moment, when I wielded the lightning, I felt something new in me, like an animal that has long lain dormant and has finally been reawakened. My fangs are connected to my heart. However, I cannot be this wild man fully. I am an animal who has lived his whole life in captivity. I am the bird with clipped wings. But there for a moment, I flew. I tasted what it is to be free. To become the animal I was meant to be. Surely you must think me mad, that I would find such amusement in this realization. Verily, it was these baby birds who gave me this cheerful heart. For even if I am the animal who has recently broken free from captivity, and will never know what it is to truly be wild, to have one's own culture derived from one's own blood. Still, I am overwhelmed with exultation to know that each subsequent generation removed from the Semitic cage will drive itself closer and closer to our true mode of being, that the Mimetic key will be reforged in time, that one day our potential will be unlocked. It brings me great joy to know 
that even if my wings are clipped, the child of tomorrow will fly. For that is his inner drive. His instinct will compel him towards the sky to a new world. A beautiful world, because the Aryan craves the beautiful. It is there in the sweetness of Tchaikovsky's melodies. And it is there in the drama carved in Laocoon and his sons. He will crave a world of justice and individual responsibility. For he fundamentally seeks truth and freedom. The drive towards knowing, the chase of the sun, is inextricably linked to freedom. For how could such an endeavor be made without an unleashed mind? A new world where little boys and girls with blue eyes will not be taught that they are wicked for simply being. A world free of the Semitic impulse. A world free of the obfuscator. Chapter 6 The Obfuscator We now make our way to the great metropolis in twilight. Hopefully there we will find an inn for proper supper and rest. Yesterday we were wild men, but tonight we must be civilized, for we are Aryan after all. We follow the path, limping ever forward, until we reach the gates of the city. There, we spot a soldier who stands alone on the wall. I call out to him. How strange that such an immense city would only house a single soldier on its walls. He looks down at me, and with a stoic expression retorts. I am the only soldier left who defends this city. The others have abandoned their posts. Some have left this place entirely, but most have joined ranks with those who wish to tear down these very walls in the name of peace. Peace? I mutter. Do they not realize that these walls are the very things which have maintained peace? The soldier responds with gloom. This city was once a beacon of light in our dark world, but as of late, she has grown dim. I fear that I'm the last ember. Truly, there are no more heroes in this city. And when I die, so too will the last of the men who wish to guard the memory of her flame. We continue our way into the dying metropolis. Stay close, Ryder, for this place has an uncanny way of robbing innocence and polluting what is clean. On every corner and in every alleyway, there lurks those who harbor malice for the European continuum. Rarely, if ever, do they appear in the open with their machinations, for it is their way to hide in the shadows. However, when they do reveal themselves, they always assume the position of a messiah, one who must break down pre-existing culture and bring forth a new morality. Come, let us find shelter for tonight, but know that as soon as the sun rises in the morning, we will be off. We had to never stray in a place of decay for too long, lest we become part of the festering. Some ways down the road there is a man dressed in red standing under a street light, calling out to a crowd gathered around him. He shouts and points his fingers as he states, It is the capitalists, the aristocracy, the bourgeoisie, who have stolen virtue from this land. These demons who care little for me, the proletariat, must be annihilated. The crowd cheers, and a rope is put around the neck of a statue, which bears the likeness of the founder of this metropolis. In an instant, it is pulled to the ground, and the crowd once more erupts in rancorous cheers. Ryder, look behind the man wearing red who raves and barks. Do you see what I see? There lies a Semitic troll, dressed in black with a small hat, periodically whispering into his ear. Look at how the man in red only makes statements after being guided by this troll. Know this, the Semitic troll cares little for capitalists or communists, for his game is the acquisition of power. It was, after all, the Semitic capitalists on Wall Street who funded Lenin and his rise of that wicked Semitic Soviet state.
The troll does not care if he rules with a hammer and sickle or the almighty coin, for he only cares to increase his dominance. One could quickly dismiss any charge of evil in his inner nature as being simply a survival mechanism. But one must look closer to reveal what separates monsters from men. We continue down the dimly lit streets on our search for an inn. As we walk by, we see a man painting a picture of the city skyline. It is exquisite in its detail and use of color. However, many of his works lie in the trash near his easel. I speak out to him. Your paintings are sublime. Are you from the school of the realists or the romantics? Do my eyes fool me or do I see evidence that you are a master of impressionism as well? For there are many styles and representations of reality in your works that lie here in these trash bins. Surely your art should reside on walls rather than in the waste. Perhaps if you should sell your works rather than throwing them away, you might become rich and famous. He smiles, yet his eyes maintain their despondency when he lets out. Thank you, friend. However, my works are no longer fashionable. In confusion, I mutter out, is the beautiful no longer in fashion? He turns and points to the massive artworks that adorn the tall buildings in this dying city as he speaks. The new artist has come and made me irrelevant. We look up to where he points and behold what modernity calls art. Crude images pulled together to glorify ugliness, each work with two elements in common the ineptness of the artist, and a plaque written by some Semitic troll with an affirmation of the work's genius quality. My eyes finally return to his as I murmur. I see. So beauty has gone out of style after all. Our journey continues as we pass into an alleyway. There we encounter a police officer on his knees surrounded by a pack of negroes. He is weeping madly as he cries out, Please, I didn't mean to offend you. I must have been in error. Call out to the police officer. What are you doing on the ground, whimpering? He looks to me as tears stream from his eyes and he says, I thought I had seen these fine men walk out with wares from a local shop without paying. The shopkeeper pointed them out, but he must have been mistaken. One of the negroes declares, He ain't mistaken. He lied. He racist. Just like this pig who cried like a bitch. We didn't do nothing. We's good boys. The officer cries out, No, I swear I'm not racist. Please, if anyone hears what you're saying, I'll lose my job. I have a wife and a child, and I cut the officer off as I look over the negroes. What exactly are they accused of stealing? The officer once again turns to us as he proclaims, It was, it was nothing really. Just some uh, televisions, a few liquor bottles, and uh, uh, some Air Jordans. The negroes do nothing to hide what they hold, each carrying televisions or entire cases full of alcohol and each wearing brand new Air Jordans. A Negro calls out, Yo, you don't own this city no more. Them new laws mean you can't do shit. In confusion, I speak to the police officer. New laws? The officer winces and cries out, I had completely forgotten that it was no longer legal to apprehend you fine gentlemen. As I am of the old type, and you are of the new, as I am ugly and light-colored, and you yourselves are beautiful and dark. These good sirs have mercy. I didn't realize that our beloved Semitic mayor had already implemented his great new societal law. The Negro kicks the officer lower to the ground and barks out. We done done for today, Negro. He spits on the officer and the other negroes begin laughing, squealing in delight as they walk away. We too walk away, for I cannot bear to see such groveling. As we exit the alleyway, 
we see a parade crossing through the streets. There we spot men, women, and children, all colored in rainbow paint. They laugh and sing. Rejoice, for the children of this world have been freed from the shackles of the Western norms. Love is love. Riding in a float high above the street resides an old, weathered, Semitic troll, smiling and waving as he passes. Next to him, on each side, are little boys and girls. Today they have been told to rejoice for their heroes. Yet their smiles do not hide their confusion and fear. On each side of the float, men, half nude, dance and touch themselves, throwing beads to the crowd below. Once again, the hatred forms deep in my gut. My hand grabs my dagger beneath the cloak, but we must not act. For though we may slay Semitic hobgoblins and trolls in the wild, here, in their domain, we are outnumbered by the thousands. As one float passes, another comes our way. On this decorated platform stands faux women, who were once men next to scientists, clergy of new. Towering above them, a large painting of Magnus Hirschfeld serves to remind the audience the glory of the Semitic cause equality. A new float emerges, carrying screeching nude women, chanting, Women of the world, free yourselves from the shadows of patriarchy. Meet men, always with mistrust. There on a plaque, in the middle of their display, features various names of Semitic female trolls and their accomplishments. Come, Ryder. We draw too close to this river of poison. Let us find an inn for the night. Finally, we stumble upon a small pub with an inn upstairs. A lantern hangs on a sign in front of the entrance that reads, Burubrao Kela. Moths circle the lantern's flame, bringing respite to my weary heart and serving as a reminder of our own chase of the sun. We enter the inn and find ourselves a warm room with dry beds. Ryder, before we rest, I must explain something to you. Tonight as we passed from place to place in this dreadful city, I saw firsthand the workings of the obfuscator. This creature who craves the withered branch, who wishes to gouge out the eye of being. Do you understand why he bears this name? For he is the mortal enemy of the seeker. He desires above all else the rejection of truth. That which does not conform to his megalomania is ruthlessly stamped out and forgotten. This creature, the obfuscator, works against being's capacity to know itself. He yearns to warp the lens of being. Ryder, do you remember the man in red? Who spoke with such hate for the aristocracy, the rich, the capitalist. Was this man, draped in red, born hating them? Or was he manipulated by Semitic deception? Verily it was Marx, the Semite, who first gave birth to this abortion, communism. Was it not Lenin, a Semite, who gave rise to the first communist state? Was it not the Semitic troll in every nation, there in the early 20th century, pushing for red reform? Had the bravery of the nationalist within Germany faltered, they too would have fallen victim in the schemes of the international Semitic clique. Indeed, even that only held back the inevitable. Here we see the obfuscator attempt to stamp out hierarchy. There we see him wish to foment class hatred as a means of social division. For is it not true that one must divide to conquer? Here, as the capitalist, he maximizes profits by treating men as cogs. There, as the communist, he turns men into cogs for his social equality machine. Everywhere and at all times, he warps truth in the attempt to gain power, a power to fulfill his ambition, his master race. 
The seeker does not desire the power to dominate simply to fulfill a myth of supremacy, but rather he dominates because of his relentless drive towards truth. Even if the pursuit of truth leads to a foregoing of his own myths, just as Socrates challenged Homer, Luther challenged the church, the Romans challenged their king, and Hume challenged Christ. The seeker is well equipped with the adaptations for the purpose of chasing the sun. The seeker dominates as the lion dominates through his natural will and strength. He resides at the peak of the hierarchy of being because his soul craves a deeper understanding of that which is. The seeker's weapon is the microscope and the paintbrush, the pen and the sword. The obfuscator too is equipped with adaptation when he dominates with lies and deception. His fangs take the shape of corrupted universities. His shield, a monopoly over media which promotes his fabrications daily. The seeker will spill his blood for freedom so that he may pursue truth unimpeded. The obfuscator in contrast will spill the blood of men he calls friends so that he may dominate both his enemies and allies, all to maintain his house of cards, his myth, and his megalomania. So too does the obfuscator hate beauty, because he does not see himself as beautiful. He sat there in envy like a desert rat when he looked across the sea at the Hellenes. He never built works of art that conveyed the idealized form the way the Greeks had. For the Greek, was said to have engaged in a massive conflict for the beauty of Helen of Troy, and that those men who waged war were champions of strength and valor. But what of the Semite, when he looked at his women with the likeness of the witches of European folklore, and his men, small and weak, had forced upon himself reflection that challenged his profound belief of supremacy? This culminated in a deep hatred of the European form. This is why when he comes to dominate a particular field of the arts, he brings it to a lowly state, glorifying excrement and misshapen broken people. He is the king of the misshapen. Tell me, is it not strange that these Semites who attain massive fortunes always seek out blonde European women? It is as if in his right hand he curses you, and with his left, he begs to be more like you. Look at this creature who seeks out the precious elements of the European, so that by merging the blood, he may sate his own megalomania. For semite blood alone is incapable of bringing forth the overman, despite what the ascetic Semitic Aryan might say. He learns to mimic quality art, mass producing it for a profit, never fully grasping the desire for the transcendental for he has never known the transcendental. For even the Semitic god grows tired of his ugly chosen people. Look how he bestows full glory to the Negro, not out of kindness, but as a means to further his social engineering. He didn't fight to give the Negro equal footing with the Aryan in America, but simply to bring about equality. Through the American Negro, the Semite gained both an ally to garner political capital and a biological weapon to dull out the otherwise keen senses of the Aryan, his mortal enemy. In truth, the Semite hates the African. When alone, he regards him as less than human. Know this, from the Semitic perspective, both the Aryan and African are mere goyim. Cattle. It was through the Roman that the Semite fully realized his effeminate characteristics. These characteristics, which formed as an antithesis to Achilles, would only grow stronger the longer he was without a home to defend. For when the Roman had successfully destroyed Jerusalem and the Second Temple, the Semite lost any masculinity he possessed. For now he had to put away the sword and take up the coin as his sole weapon. Now he would be like a woman, unable to defend himself and forced to rely on the strength of others. How fortunate for him that the Roman Empire would later adopt his Semitic god. 
or otherwise he would have surely perished. Over time, this warping led him to seek the transcendent and depraved sexuality, a search for the noble and good within, a nobility that simply did not exist. This pursuit culminated in his thesis of the authoritarian personality, a brush with which he would mar the name of the Aryan in the 20th century. Armed with this meme, he swore to break down the Aryan's familial structures, the source of their unity. The intellectual Semite will be quick to remind you of the Hellenes and their supposed love of homosexuality. Yet, never does he speak of the Athenian laws that barred homosexuals from becoming one of the nine archons or acting as an advocate for the state. In truth, the Semite cares little for feminists and transvestites for they are merely tools to be used to deconstruct the European continuum's sense of family. Every step forward the obfuscator takes, he does so to gouge out the eye of being. For if he is successful in his destruction of the European continuum, then he will indeed reign supreme. But at what cost? A world where mankind has been made into a semi-bestial form? A world where the nuclear family is passé? A world where paintings made of feces are hailed as powerful and brave for challenging social norms, while our monuments, glorifying the beauty of being, are made artificially unfashionable. A world where men see themselves as classes rather than as countrymen and as brothers. A world full of bleached, blonde Jewesses with misshapen bodies who will carve out chunks of their noses so that they can look more like the very people they swore to destroy. An ugly world that hates the beautiful. In the end, I wonder, will the Semite's atom bomb fall into the hands of primitive forms of man? Is it possible that these archaic subspecies, who will inevitably rise up against the Semite with their sheer numbers, will not be cautious? and bring forth a total annihilation of life on Earth, an end to being's awareness of itself, the end of knowing. Rider, you must understand this. Just as there are Europeans who would aid in the advancement of the unknowing, there also exists Semites who assist in the elevation of the knowing. However, we must look at the continuum as a whole, just as there are Europeans who hate the beautiful, Despite the European continuum yearning for beauty, there too exist Semites who yearn for truth, despite the Semitic continuum craving mythical supremacy. This is another of mankind's inconsistencies we must face, for we can see both the individual and the collective. Neither can be discarded completely. I say this to you so that you understand. The Seeker isn't inherently Aryan, and the obfuscator isn't inherently the Semite. The Aryan merely maintains that position today, but if he was to be totally annihilated, then a new people would take up the call to chase the sun. It would be up to them to be the guardians of knowing, even if they are less capable of advancing the knowing. Because of their cultural or genetic properties, their continuum will still yearn for that which is for only a people who value truth can take up the title of Seeker. Even if our kind were to be lost forever to time, being would find a new champion, a greater lens for its means of knowing. The Obfuscator too can change in time. For if the Semite was to be destroyed entirely by the Aryan, would the title of Obfuscator not go to the Red Dragon, the Han, who surely see themselves as the Chosen? whose power acquisition is in rapid expansion here in the 21st century. Even if the blood of the Chinese has its own positive qualities, Marxism has made its way into their minds, thus perverting their perception of reality. They have formed within themselves the necessary characteristics to occupy the position of obfuscator, to warp the truth in the pursuit of supremacy and ideology However, if the Aryan was to be annihilated by the Semite, it is possible that the Chinese would in time, due to their natural-born intelligence and creativity, 
throw off the shackles of Marxism and take up the role of the seeker. If the new man comes into being, and was equipped with even greater faculties to aid in the quest towards the sun, and were the Aryan to hate him for his greatness, then so too could the Aryan become the obfuscator. You must rid yourself of supremacy, for megalomania and truth are not congruent. Being is that which is, not what we wish to be. You must aid the knowing relentlessly. You must make yourself an enemy of those who would warp truth in its pursuit, even if we are surpassed one day by the new man, the overman, then we must aid him in his journey on the horizon, for we are all aspects of being, conclusions of its inner desire to know, to see itself, feel itself, to be. Now let us sleep, Ryder. Tomorrow, we must once again look out at the horizon and chase the sun. Our heads hit the pillow and our eyes shut. Once more, a dream of Aphrodite. Suddenly, we are awakened by the sounds of chaos and panic. Women scream and men shout as I open the window from our room. There, out on the horizon, I see it, coming over the hills at great speed, like a tidal wave of black. The nothing, the sea of unknowing, which makes way, devours all life, sentience, sapience, even the possibility to feel will all be obliterated upon being submerged in this black tsunami, composed of nothing. For if it were to claim all of our world, then being would lose all possibilities of knowing. There would be no more beauty, for there would no longer exist beings capable of looking out and reflecting on being. Rider, we must hurry, for we have little time. Quickly, we find horses and make our way out of the doomed city. Just as we reach the gate, we again spot the lone soldier on the wall. I call out to him. Friend, it's time for you to forego defending decay. Come, join my comrade and I in our pursuit of the sun. His eyes stay looking out at the horizon at the oncoming torrent as he replies. This is the city my father's father built. It is my destiny to defend it to the end. I pause for a moment and then reply. You were wrong to say... There were no more heroes who dwell in the city. I raise my arm to give him a Roman salute. He turns his head and smiles, returning the gesture. Come, Ryder. It is not our destiny to defend decay. As we make our escape, we move to find higher ground, out towards the mountain peaks. There we witness the metropolis in twilight, finally submerged in the wave of nothing, completely lost to time. Not even the grass that circled the walls of this city remains. The landscape, now resembling an alien world devoid of life. The insects and birds, men and women, the old and young, even the streets and towers have been completely erased. But there, where the lone soldier stood, lies a mound of debris, a small fragment of the city wall, and the few moths that hover above are now all that remain of that once great city of light. Chapter 7 The Republicant at the End of the World For two days we have journeyed towards a new place, remote and very different from the last. The path ahead is marked by an ever-growing number of telephone poles and electric wires. This road that we travel is littered with the displaced from the metropolis in twilight, looking to find a new home. These people now make their way as we do towards the land of the suburban syndicate, there at the end of the world. It is said that this place, built by the men who wish to withdraw from the reality of their condition, is the last great bastion of the so-called West. This retreat, called a suburb, built on a cliff, towers above that old eastern desert, filled with the bones of the Aryan youth. There in that sand pit, fit for devils, lie the remains of the children of the European Continuum. An unlikely grave for an Aryan, there in the motherland of the Semite. Rumors abound that the suburban syndicate harbors a doomsday cult that worships a titan called the Republicant. We pass through a multitude of identical houses lined with well-maintained lawns and plastic trees, hedgerows and white picket fences, 
as we draw ever further into this suburbia. Here nearly everything is adorned with my red, white, and blue. Patriotism on display. From the stickers on the backs of vehicles, to the ribbons tied around the telephone poles. Know this. Though things here seem pleasant, in truth, there are sinister undertakings afoot. Ryder, look here at this sign. It bears an image of the suburban senator with a Semitic gremlin from the desert below clinging to his shoulder. The image reads simply, Remember our eternal alliance. Behind them, a picture of those two great twin towers in flames before they collapsed and were made into dust. That image, burned into the eyes of my countrymen, will serve well as a mimetic key to unlock my inner chaos. Finally, we make our way to the center of this citizen's paradise, at the very edge of the cliffs, where stands a massive Romanesque temple, encircled by a large audience undergoing some type of ceremony. There above the steps of the temple, standing at the podium, lies the suburban senator with a Semitic gremlin from the desert below, clinging to his shoulder. The senator calls out, My fellow suburbians, it brings me no joy to inform you of this, but that great metropolis which housed so much evil has finally been annihilated from this world. The audience cries out in terror. The senator speaks up once more. However, do not fear, for we need only to maintain our pact with our friends from the desert below, and we shall conserve both our lives and our lounge. Faces in the audience instantly change from fear to overwhelming joy and laughter as they cry out in ecstasy. The Semitic gremlin, whose smile betrays all innocence, leans into the ear of the senator and whispers something. In a moment, the senator lets out. Are there any young man today who would give up his life for freedom? Suddenly, a voice is heard from the back of the crowd. A young man, standing with his all-too-Americana white southern family, speaks. For the love of liberty, I would give up my life today so that freedom may endure forever. The audience claps so as to maintain their routine. The young man hugs his family, and then, to our horror, he walks off the side of the cliff. We run to the edge only to witness his body hit the rocks below. Just as he is made no more, the audience begins singing. Lord, we shall prevail. Lord, we shall prevail. Writer, this mutilation of the European vine has gone on for too long. I have brought you here so that with your aid we may tear down this system of evil. However, it has been said to me by those who carry the remains of the National Socialist banner that it will be impossible to dislodge my countrymen from this cult. That until the nothing makes its way further into this region, my compatriots will maintain their illusions of conservatism and a false sense of security under the shadow of a red titan. Some used to say back at my old pub that we should harness the power of this titan, the Republicant, that we could use it as a weapon to dispel the Semitic curse. I shall disregard both positions, for here today I aim to kill the titan itself. If it can be destroyed completely, and perhaps my countrymen can be made free of this black-hearted Semitic sorcery. Otherwise, the nothing will come, regardless of their illusions. We make our way in front of the crowd, between their eyes and the gremlin and its puppet politician. As the crowd continues to chant in their hypnotic state, I call out to them, Brothers, sisters, my countrymen, you who hold freedom in your hearts, do you not see that we have been tricked? That a terrible spell has been put over you, allowing you to send your children over cliffs to a bastardized desert landscape filled with the most wretched of beings' creations? How do you fight for freedom, spilling your blood for Semites who wish to lord over the world, daily remove the very freedom you proclaim to love? The crowd is made silent. The gremlin, still maintaining its smile, leans over and whispers into the senator's ear. Suddenly, the senator calls out. Here at the firm, we appreciate all political speech. However, this is not election season. 
If you wish to change anything about this paradise that we have made, you must simply run for office. Now, son, please remain quiet as we continue our procession. I begin to laugh as I state, I am not here to vote or be made a puppet. If these people were not bombarded by the Semitic spell which forces a pernicious illusion, and surely any sacred clown could win an election against a eunuch Semitic puppet such as yourself. The senator scowls as the gremlin leans in to whisper in his ear once more. I call out to the gremlin. I know why you aided the Mohammedan ghoul in his machinations there on that September day. It was just another anchor, another means to keep this people tied to your desert to fulfill your ambitions. I know why you aimed to destabilize the entirety of the desert world you came from. How could it be anything less than Lebensraum? For Israel is reborn. She has slept for two thousand years, and now she awakes, hungry, ready to devour the world. The gremlin's smile fails as fear makes way. It pauses for a moment, then leans into the puppet politician's ear. The senator suddenly barks. This here is the Antichrist. Here's come the signal the end times. The audience cries out in fear, slowly backing away from us. We reveal our daggers as I state. The Antichrist? We have come to erase Semitic myths, not fulfill them. In the distance, a rumbling sound comes from inside the temple. Once. And again. The sound of giant footsteps draws to a crescendo until, lumbering out of the shadows, comes the Republicant. This red monstrosity, towering at over 18 foot, with a giant's body and the head of an elephant, ducks down to fit through the final columns as it walks out the temple to meet us for sacred combat. Rider. Know this, the Republicant was first used in the American Civil War. It is said to have wiped out entire regiments alone, back when Atlanta met the nothing. Even cannon fire cannot pierce its thick skin. Today, we shall endeavor to resume the Battle of Appomattox, and this time, win it for good. The Republican begins walking towards us. Rider, focus. Remember what we learned in the storm on the heights of circumspection. Now is the moment we must unleash that hatred. Now is the time to manifest the chaotic. I think of those towers that once symbolized my fatherland's prosperity and the cruelty of their fate. Our grips tied on our daggers, we blast with raging speed like lightning unleashed. I do not believe the monster expected such momentum, for it does nothing as I run up the side of its arm leaping across as my dagger slashes its eye. It screams in pain as I land close beneath, near its legs. Ryder, be careful. A single blow from such a colossal opponent could prove deadly. The Titan raises up its leg and brings it down with such force that even though we manage to dodge, we are not spared from its impact. And we are both thrown to the ground. Quickly we return to our feet. With wicked speed I leap into the air once more, but I am caught by its massive arm, and it swats me away like an insect, hurling me across the street until finally I make impact with the side of a car, crushing the door and window. The Republican begins charging in my direction. Perhaps it was a little ambitious to meet a creature like this in its own home. I pull myself from the tangled wreck just in time to miss being crushed by the Titan's tusks. The Republican's face now lodged into the side of the vehicle gives me the opportunity I need as I make my way up its back and attempt to stab it in the spine. I plunge my dagger down, but it is stopped by this pachyderm's resilient epidermis. Mere blades are useless against such a creature. The Republican finally dislodges its tusks from the side of the car, throwing me once again high into the air. Luckily, I managed to land on my feet some steps from where you stand, Ryder. The Red Titan turns to look at us, its hand holding its eye, still gushing with blood. And suddenly, we hear the Senator cry out. Come, friends! Let us aid our guardian! Do you not see that he has been wounded? 
from the crowd who still linger not too far away comes a young, beautiful woman. She walks up to the Colossus as it looks at her. The Republican pauses for a moment and picks her up with a single hand. It brings her close and opens its mouth. In an instant, it devours her upper half and swallows while discarding her lower. Through some type of malicious magic, the beast's eye begins to heal rapidly. In less than a few seconds, the Republican is once again ready for combat. I call out to my people. Brothers, please end this madness. But they only look on with blank stares. The Republican begins charging our way once more. Just before it makes impact, we dive to the side. And this time, the Titan smashes through a telephone pole. Sparks fly as the creature rights itself and turns to face us. And turns to face us. Ryder, our daggers are of no use, but it appears fate has given us opportunity to wield lightning once more. Come, follow me. With great speed, we dart over to the next telephone pole and await the beast. The Republican cries out and once more begins its charge. Again, with wicked speed, we dodge just before it delivers its fatal blow. Once again, a telephone pole is snapped in half and sparks are cast out in great number. We move to another pole, then another, and another. Eventually, the entire battlefield is littered with electrical wire sparking and hissing. The Republican launches out once more with a charge, but this time, as it makes its impact, it catches itself in the entangled wires, causing it to trip and wrap itself in them as it tumbles down. Instantly, a flash blinds our eyes as the Colossus goes up like the 4th of July. As the smoke clears, we see the Titan laying on the ground, smoldering. Sparks still letting out here and there. The Republican's skin now bubbles as boiling blood pours from its eyes and its mouth. Well done, Ryder. I suppose we've turned the old party into something less than grand. The crowd begins to cry and weep like mad. The senator with the gremlin whispering in his ear looks to his flock and yells. What are you waiting for, you fools? You know what must be done. In an instant, the citizens begin hurling themselves off the cliff. The little girl runs straight towards the edge, and just before she does so, I seize her. But I cannot stop the others as I cry out, PLEASE, THINK OF WHAT YOU'RE DOING! After a round a hundred or so had leapt to their deaths, the Republican begins to move its limbs. Slowly it rises to once again tower above us. It lets out a great roar. It must have been loud enough to hear for miles. The senator begins weeping as he screams to his flock, Revelation 8-7, the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mangled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all who grew in grass was burnt up. Ryder, I was in error to think we could tackle this titan, here in the domain of its cult. However, if we can strike down the gremlin, perhaps it will break this curse. I look to see the Semitic creature screaming into the ear of the senator. They can't be seen working together! They can't be seen working together! I think to myself, who can't be seen working together? Then, from the woods nearby, we hear the gallop of a second colossus racing towards our position. The trees begin to give way, left and right, and then, towering high above, enters the Donkocrat, charging straight forward. This four-legged titan, even larger than the Republican, must have come to the aid of its sibling. Know this. Though they are made to appear to be enemies, they are both fundamentally Semitic Glamim. There is little time, Ryder. We must cut off the head of the snake before any more harm can come to my countrymen. I lunge towards the gremlin that clings on the puppet politician's shoulder. I launch myself high into the air with my dagger's blade in line with the Semitic wretch's throat. But just before I can bring the dagger to its target, 
A gigantic Donkocrat bites down on my arm, then hurls me high into the sky. Tremendous pain shoots through me as I come crashing down to the earth. Even though I manage to land on my feet, I am immediately brought to my knees. Suddenly, I realize I've not only lost my dagger, but my right arm as well. This is no good, Ryder. Sacred clowns do better when they have all their limbs intact. No, it is of no concern. It's just a flesh wound. My left hand alone can snap this gremlin's neck. I sprint up the stairs toward the podium to meet my enemy, only to suddenly be blown away as the Republican captures me in its charge. Before I know it, I am impaled on this monstrosity's tusk. My body, which up to this point had been completely filled with hate, begins to let fear seep in. No, I can't allow a single second of doubt, of cowardice. I begin punching the eye of the Republican with the only arm I have left, as I hang, skewered in its jaws. The Republican grabs hold of my leg as to pull me on. The pain becomes unimaginable as its tusk begins to tear through my organs. With my other leg, I give out a great kick, piercing directly into the left eye of the Titan. The Republican cries out in pain as it yanks me down, ripping both myself free from the tusks, as well as my leg free from myself. I fall, narrowly catching the edge of the cliff. There I hang with one arm and one leg. The Republican looks down at me with eyes burning with hatred. It brings its leg up once more. And suddenly, I see your dagger rider flying through the air and making its way into the right eye of the monstrosity. The Republican cries out with terrible sound as its leg comes crashing down, missing me and causing the Titan to hurl itself off the cliff. Unfortunately, as it comes my way, the Republican's hand catches my crimson swastika cloak and brings me down as we both plummet to the desert below. There is only black. Yet still I have consciousness. I managed to open a single eye. Ah uh, yes, I remember now. A battle. I look down with what life I have left at my remains and surroundings. My body, now broken beyond repair, lies dying. Here in this graveyard unfit for an Aryan. Blood saturates this area like spilled wine and an orgy. The beast lies next to me. It does not appear to be healing. Perhaps it is finally dead. Are you still up there, Ryder? Did you get the gremlin? Have we saved my countrymen? Suddenly, I see the fluttering of small wings coming out of my pocket, and before my eyes flies out a moth. I wonder, did you come all this way with me? From that dreaded city in twilight that no longer exists. Go on, little one, and find a new flame to chase. I suppose here and now, I must face death's embrace. I pause and reflect. Then, with the last pockets of air that have not been submerged by the blood that ever fills my lungs, I whisper, but where's the fear? I smile as tears fall from my eyes. I look out and see the sun setting. I raise the only arm I have left give the sun a Roman salute. With my last breath, I whisper, Thank you. Right then and there, I was a sacred clown filled with satisfaction. My eyes shut and I sleep. Hours pass as I bake in the hot sun until finally it is night. How could it be that I have not yet bled out? Why does my spirit linger here? I look out once again at the landscape that will be my tomb. It is littered with so many of my people who died here for nothing, and for thee nothing. This is no holy land, no, not for an Aryan. My body shakes as I feel death's breath on my skin. My eyes wander to the stars. A smile comes over me as, still, the satisfaction lingers. Suddenly one of the stars becomes brighter and brighter until I see her face within the glimmering light. She who was made for me, whose ivory skin glows like the moon in the dark night. She 
the guardian of love, man's natural cleric, Aphrodite, her sweet name, slowly floats down to my dying body and gently kisses my bloody lips. She holds my face with both her hands. She looks into my eyes, saying, There is still work to be done, my sacred clown. You, child of Dionysus, you are not allowed to die yet. Chapter 8 The Fourth Punic War Steady your trembling hands, sacred cloud, for you live again, whispers Aphrodite. I look to see that I am once again whole, shrouded in her glow, the only light here in this abyss. I observe my hand and move my fingers as I state, How can it be that I was satisfied with my death, but you were not? What left is there for a sacred clown to do? Let me die here with my compatriots. Let them call me the last American, so that they may endeavor to take up the new flag. Aphrodite smiles and says, I will not, for I shall aid you until I am unable. I will be with you until the end. I mutter out, the end? She gives no pause and replies. Until the return of the Arian. I stare into her eyes as I remark. Then what is to be done? Aphrodite looks to the ground dolefully as she explains. You and your companion must travel to the swamps of sadness. There you must retrieve the sacred sword. Do you know of the creature that lurks in that swamp? My eyes remain on hers as I let out. Yes, the old hag, Nihilism. They say she is immortal. Aphrodite places her hand on my cheek as she states, Nothing is truly immortal apart from being, through man's will and the aid of the gods. Anything is possible. Forget not that you, sacred clown, ride out with a rare zeal. I look away as I remark. They say none who have ventured into that swamp have ever returned. But the light makes its way in and never escape. Even if I possess my dagger, I know not a way to kill her. That black witch, nihilism. Aphrodite, still cupping my cheek, turns my face to meet her eyes once more as she states, No weapon, whether made of bronze or steel, could ever destroy such a creature. Only when you wield the sacred weapon will she be made no more. Indeed, she recognizes this and guards that relic relentlessly. For that hag knows, the day in which the Aryan finds his purpose is the day she will cease to be. My eyes widen as I whisper with gloom, but the knowing, is it sufficient? Is it something men could live and die for? Will they join our ranks, even if we cannot guarantee them immortality? Aphrodite smiles and responds. Even here, after toppling titans and rescuing a goddess, you fill yourself with doubt. One must be sure when he steps into that swamp, or else he will sink into despair. However, I know your heart well, for it is where I reside. You will not sink, sacred clown, for you are a true believer. Aphrodite, with her hair floating above me, as if in water, begins to speak again. Once you make your way into the swamp, you must continue ever forward until you find the sacred sword, which remains buried in the stump 
of a very old tree. So old, in fact, that it was planted by the gods even before the Trojans became Roman. The gods foresaw the need to hide away magic relics bestowed with their powers, so that when an age of darkness came, heroes would find them, and with their aid, bring back light once more into our world. This dark age, Pax Judaica, is coming to an end. We must prepare ourselves, for the new heroic age begins. Your sacred weapon will take the shape of the Gladius Hispaniensis, for this sword has long awaited you. With a confused expression, I let out. You mean there's more than one sacred weapon? She gives no pause and responds. Indeed. For the gods, before they were annihilated by Semitic impulses, hid away their magic in many items instruments and paintbrushes, computers, and of course the sacred firearm. All hold unlocked potential for those who will struggle in the name of Europe. The soldier of tomorrow, who will battle against the Semitic forces, will wield the sacred rifle, a weapon imbued with the very magic of Thor, but does it not thunder? When its bolt is launched, this magic will only aid those who fight for this purpose. To bring forth the Aryan's will towards knowing, and just as it will give uncanny strength to Europe's warriors, it too gives prowess to its artists. The painter, who carries in his heart the desire to bring back life to the European continuum, will manifest art with a sacred paintbrush that will pierce through the Semite propaganda and capture the hearts of his people. The meme makers, the dreamers of dreams, aided by the speed of Hermes himself, will reveal the lies of the Semite news agencies every hour of every day. Aphrodite takes my hand and brings it to her cheek, saying, your weapon, however, was forged for your line alone. There, during the Second Punic War, when all hope seemed lost for Rome, Scipio Africanus tasked the Iberian to forge a new Roman sword. This weapon would revolutionize Roman warfare. It was this specific blade he took with him to Zama. There, where he made the elite Semite, Hannibal Barca, kneel. Upon Scipio's death, his blade was assumed lost, but in truth it was picked up by the dwarves, Brokir and Aetiri. There they reforged the weapon with magic runes, so that its blade would always be coated in light. Then it was passed to Floyd New who engraved into its happiness the roots of this new people, the people who wish to bring forth. After that, it was dipped into the celestial fire in Svarog's forge, and finally a symbol older than the Proto-Europeans was etched onto the Pelpatel, a symbol that means to be. I whisper in confusion, to be. Aphrodite smiles and replies, You will understand in time, my sacred clown. Suddenly there is a crash as rocks and pebbles tumble down the cliffside. I look up only to once again be reunited with you, Ryder. You beautiful bastard. You still live. You've wandered down here to continue our journey yet again. Though I must say, I am tired of having to rendezvous after falling from such great heights. I look to Aphrodite and say, Is there any way you could bring back to life all who lie here in this grave not fit for Arians? Aphrodite's face turns gloomy as she replies, I am sorry, my sacred clown, but they are far too gone. I used what power I had left 
to travel here and bring you to life once more. The old gods have only recently begun to stir from their graves, and they lack the power they once wielded. I reach out and touch her arm as I ask, will the new people understand you the way they must understand you? As phenomena, she pauses for a moment and then replies, Do not worry how they view the gods. For the new people must dwell on the phenomenon of man. I begin tightening my boots and my various belts. Come along, Ryder. We have a long journey ahead. Aphrodite, still floating above, calls out. Gentlemen, you must understand that the wars between the Stramite and the Aryan have been going on since the two forms converged. Long has it been held that the Roman won the Punic Wars, and in the end, the Semitic state, Carthage, was lost forever. But in truth, it was the Semite who was victorious, for buried in the success of the Roman conquest of Carthage lay the seeds of its inevitable undoing. Rome, having lost her only real competitor, would rapidly expand across the whole of the Mediterranean. Eventually, she would move into a territory inhabited by a Semite known as the Jew. There, in what would become the Roman province of Judea, a meme was born from a cult derived of the Semitic continuum. This meme harbored elements of the inner mode of being of the Semite and the cult of the Jew. It would later expand its mimetic influence to the entirety of the European continuum. For it was the Semitic impulse that eventually made its way all throughout Europe like a cancer. It was this impulse that gave the Jew the ability to live in your fatherland. For both you and the Jew were now from Adam's seed. It was that impulse which toppled the statues of the Hellenes. For fear that they harbored demons, the banking system built on usury that would later come to dominate our kind completely would have never developed within Europe's borders without that impulse spreading to every corner of your world. In the end, it was the Aryan who lost himself, and it was the Shemite who would rule not only the Mediterranean, but the world. Your blade was forged to taste Shemite blood, even though the variant of Shemite you must struggle against is very different than that of Hannibal and his Carthaginians. For the Carthaginian knew of war, and what it is to be a champion. But the Jew, throughout his historical development, became the arbiter of unknowing, the obfuscator. For the Semite and the Aryan have long been rivals. Let it be said that Carthage pushed Rome to its limits. But this variant of the Semite, the Jew, brings forth a tower beyond comprehension. For this Jew willingly aids the sea of unknowing. He gives rise to the nothing through his machinations, and if he achieves the ambitions of his megalomania and inverts the natural world, he will bring forth the death of mankind completely. But all is not lost, for the Great Awakening is now underway. Here in the 21st century, the war that will decide the fate of beings knowing has begun. Aphrodite once more places her hand on my cheek as she states, You must be swift, for the forces of darkness now gather. The Shemite has cast an assassin from the Red Dragon to hunt you down. He is the champion of the Han. He will seek you out, as your ambitions threaten his own. The men of the European Continuum 
must awaken in time. Only when the sacred sword is retrieved, and you do with it what you must, will they be ready to find their own sacred weapons. Only when the purpose, the knowing, is in your heart and the sacred sword is in your hands, will you become the new man. Only then will we see the return of the Aryan. Only then can you make the undreamer recall. Only then can you turn back the tide of the nothing. Chapter 9 The Vampiric Bankers and Their Great Anti-Semite We three agreed to part once more. Aphrodite would make her way back to the lagoon of nymphs and fairies, for she too, like all the gods, had been depleted of her past strength. Only time would tell if phenomena, the appendages of being, could be loved by man again. We slipped through the desert which gave birth to the Semite, and past the barren mountains where druids dare not tread. Finally, we make our way to a small village, surrounded by the undead forest. It is said that each of these trees started as a man impaled on a pike, that the one who impaled them was born a vampire, from the stock of Satan himself. However, that is merely a myth, for in truth, he was not a vampire, but only a man, and it wasn't men that he impaled. No, they were the Mohammedan ghouls, those beasts from the south who for centuries would enslave our youth and forcefully convert them or leave them nailed to that old Semitic tree. The story itself makes one wish to be a crusader, but what were the crusades if not a Semitic civil war? Both fight for the tree of Abraham, one as well as the other, propagates Semitic myths. Finally, we reach the village that lies in the heart of the forest. Perhaps here we can get some rest before we make our way to the swamps of sadness. Ryder, do you see what I see? Nearly everyone here looks pale and sickly. Fear and despondency mark their faces. As these shadows of people drift through the streets, suddenly I hear a shout. It's the Semitic vampires and their blood magic that's put us in this sorry state. We look to see a man standing on a small stage built out of the side of a traveling wagon. On top of the wagon reads a sign, the great anti-Semite. Oddly enough, this man who rants and raves is wearing a very similar attire to my own. He even wears my crimson swastika cloak. The crowd, from time to time, cheers and calls out profanities as this great anti-Semite gives his lecture. I turn to a villager who stands in the crowd and speak. Tell me, friend, who is this great anti-Semite? And what are these Semitic vampires that he speaks of? The villager wearing torn rags and tired eyes replies, this here is our leader, for he is the only one who speaks up in the name of truth. We were once a happy village until the communist ogres arrived and exacted on us their cruel demands. You see, they came with their guns and forced us to annually give up three quarters of all the food we grow. It was difficult enough to begin with, however, a blight set in not too long after, which made our task impossible. When the Semitic vampires first came, we thought they were a godsend. They offered us aid, the use of their dark power. All they asked for in exchange was a single vial of blood from our folk. After we had agreed on terms, we awoke the next day to see our crops had grown exponentially. And when the communist augurs came, and took what they wanted. We even had enough left so that our poor could still eat. A shout is heard as the great anti-Semite is met on stage 
was some type of Semitic goblin. The villager looks back to me as he states, Not long after that, the blight returned to our fields. We went back to the Semitic vampires and asked for aid once more. They agreed. However, the price was to be changed. Now, they asked for an entire barrel of the blood of our folk. What choice did we have but to agree? Each man from the village gave what he had, but eventually it required the women and children to reach our quarter. This process of losing our crops and giving up our blood to the Semitic vampire has gone on for three seasons now. At present, the vampires are asking that we accept a new kind of debt, for the blood of our children's children is now forfeit. The vampires will once again loan us their dark magic, but at what cost? Fortunately, the great anti-Semite has come to aid us in our time of need. A Semitic goblin runs from one side of the stage to the other as the great anti-Semite calls out, You can run, but you cannot hide, Semitic goblin! or the forces of good cannot be stopped. The great anti-Semite pulls out a wooden sword and thrusts it toward the goblin. The goblin gives out a loud screech as it wobbles from one side to the other until finally falls back behind the wagon. The crowd gives out a cheer and money is thrown onto the stage. I look to the villager and ask, why did they throw their money at him like this? The villager now wearing a half-hearted smile replies, we give him money to say what we think. In confusion, I ask, you pay him to say what you think? I make my way around the wagon to see where the slain goblin had fallen. However, when I turn the corner, to my surprise, before me is the Semitic goblin, sitting on a wooden box, smoking. Suddenly he notices me, shrieking up wildly, nearly dropping his cigarette. Back on stage, the anti-Semite calls out, Yes! Very soon indeed, I will make my way up to that dreaded castle and get rid of those damned vampires. The crowd cheers in jubilation. Suddenly, I walk on the stage, holding the Semitic goblin by the collar as it struggles in vain. The crowd gasps as one of the villagers calls out, Look! The goblin still lives! I move forward to meet the great anti-Semite and I begin to notice his strange appearance. He wears the mask of a man that moves and shakes about unlike one. I speak to him. Your sword does not appear to be an effective means of dispatching these creatures, but fear not, for they are small and weak, and one only requires a minuscule amount of strength to send them to their maker. In an instant, I snap the neck of the Semitic goblin. The great anti-Semite shrieks, and it may have been the sounds of the crowd, but I swear I heard him say, Oh no, Larry! I drop the dead creature to the stage floor as I cry out. Now let us go as brothers hand in hand and topple these Semitic vampires who feed off you and your folk with their debt slavery. The villagers shout and raise their fists in accord. Suddenly the great anti-Semite calls out. No, no, we can't go to the castle where the vampires lie. The crowd goes silent. In confusion I ask, why not? A villager from the crowd echoes, yeah! Why not? And before long, voices from all over the crowd are demanding an answer. Why not? The great anti-Semite raises his hands to calm the crowd as he begins to speak. Have I not been here aiding you all this time? Now you question me, your leader. Do you not realize I've been fighting goblins on your behalf? Tell me, did I not lead the first party who went to kill those monsters up on the hill? Of course, it was unfortunate that all of my companions were killed, and I was the only one who survived the ordeal, but I was there. I look down to see the great anti-Semite's legs, very thin and slightly green. I look to you, with my eyebrow raised high. Ryder, are you thinking what I'm thinking? In an instant, I rip off the cloak of the great anti-Semite, and suddenly we are met with two gypsy goblins, one on top of the other so as to reach the height of a man. They both cry out as they fall to the stage floor. They begin scurrying about, trying to gather as much coin as possible back into their pockets. 
These gypsy goblins, much like their cousins of the Semitic branch, are creatures born of the unknowing, for they are content being parasites. With my boot, I crush the skull of the first gypsy goblin. I seize the other and hold him before the crowd as I speak. For too long you have put your hopes in false prophets and con men. The gypsy goblin begins to cry out in fear as it claws at my arm futilely. A villager calls out to me, Who is to lead our flock now? I smile as I state, You shall lead yourselves, and the best of you will guide the others, not because of your names or positions, but by your actions alone. You cannot allow your village to die in a single blow at the loss of some false shepherd, for the village must live, regardless of the comings and goings of kings and great men. When the communists return, you must no longer be a flock of sheep looking for a shepherd. You must now be a pack of hungry wolves, and the wolf who claims the greatest share of communist blood will be your guide. Now, wet your fangs. I throw the gypsy goblin into the crowd as they smash, stab, and tear him limb from limb. Ryder, we came here to find rest before venturing forward, but it seems we have only met more obstacles. Come, let us make our way to the Semitic vampire's castle that looms over this poor European village. We leave the villagers to rest, as they are in no shape to wage war against vampires. The hot sun bakes our backs as we journey up the long path to the dark castle. When we finally arrive at the entrance, we are met with a large door with knockers made of iron in the shape of gargoyles. Ryder, you hide in the bushes so that we may catch them off guard. I knock three times and we wait. Suddenly a window on the door opens and a Semitic goblin face is seen. It looks to me as it states, You're a little early, aren't you? Where's Larry? Come on, come on. The door opens and the goblin grabs my hand and pulls me in. It yells out to me, Are you two fools? Coming here in the middle of the day. Don't you realize one of the villagers might spot you? My eyes wander here in the interior of this dark castle. Each window is covered up with thick black curtains, and maps are fastened on every wall. These maps are of different places all over the world, yet they share a common theme. Each map has the capital city of a region outlined with numbers and dates all written in red. Piles of gold and vials of blood lie everywhere in this room. Even the crops that those villagers labored so hard to cultivate now lay rotting on the floor. Here in this accursed place, high above, I see banners adorned with the hammer and sickle that hang on the ceilings. So too do I see caskets, but they are empty. I look up to finally see the old Semitic vampires surrounded by notebooks and portfolios. I call out to them. How strange that communist ogres would allow for such lucrative banking in their midst. Even stranger that these vampiric capitalists would adorn their castle with so many hammers and sickles. One of the vampires, in confusion, remarks. What are you gypsies on about? Don't we pay you enough to keep the villagers quiet? Must I pay you more so that you will keep silent and spare me your annoyance? Now go! Tomorrow you must once again lecture the people on how the next day will be their redemption. And when that day comes, you must be there again to tell them that they must wait once more. And so on, and so on. I raise my eyebrow as I let out. I believe you have me confused for... But I am cut off when the old Semitic vampire cries out, No, it is you who are confused, you filthy gypsy. Now silence. A female vampire looks to the males as she states, It's so hard to find good goyim these days. One must always fear that a red ogre might become a starlin. I suppose I'll glam him break free eventually. It is a good thing that these gypsies are harmless. Remember when this one brought us all those men folk? We feasted for days. Did it not come up with that trick all on its own? 
Come, brothers, let us show some respect to our gypsy guest. The old Semitic vampire barks. All of these animals disgust me, for they aren't fit to lick our boots. The vampires burst into laughter as they look at me, and then back at each other. Ryder, I do not intend on leaving you outside alone for too much longer. I grow weary of this place. This international clique who support the communists with crooked capitalism, who feed off the blood of the children of Europe, must be abolished. Here, now, in the 21st century. This international debt slavery, this tithe of our children's children, has fed a parasite unlike any other in history. A people whose entire power system is based on something as hollow as debt and interest rates. These blood suckers move into a region and sap its strength, its very vitality. I call out to the vampires. I am no gypsy, I am an Aryan. They all pause, with a look of confusion and fear. The female vampire lets out. What did you say? I begin walking through the room, my hands touching various objects from the gold coins to the black curtains. I pause and then respond. How strange. I thought you vampires slept during the day, but I suppose you must find time to both prey on the living and count your coins. Back at my old pub, we used to argue late into the night about how to destroy this international banking system built on debt slavery. Some said that interest rates should be completely abolished. Others argued that loans in the end were fine. It was the Semite that had to go. The old Semitic vampire's mouth drops as his eyes ever widen. I give him a great smile as I let out. I always held the position that if one wished to destroy this parasitic system, he must combat it just as he would a den of vampires. I wink at the female Semitic vampire as I state, you must merely bring it into the light. In an instant, I pull back the black curtains. Light bursts into the room, and immediately, the vampires are turned to dust. We return to the villagers with what gold we could carry. I look out to them and speak. We are no communists, but today, we have killed the Semitic vampiric bankers and intend to give away their wealth to the folk. Take this gold to the nearby towns and purchase weapons of steel that thirst for ogre blood. When the communists return, you must liquidate them in full. Their corpses will serve as sufficient fertilizer for your crops. Go then to every town of every nation of our kind and unshackle them from the parasite. Today, you shall have your freedom and your weapons and fresh soil to begin anew. Chapter 10, The Red Dragon. For weeks I have had an uneasiness about me, a feeling that danger lurks in the shadows that line our path. Have you noticed the men in the shadows too, Ryder? Perhaps it is just my imagination? It has been two days since we ran out of the bread that was given to us, the tremendous love, by those freed villagers. And though we still have water, we are left wanting without wine. I stop as I hold out my hand. Wait. There. Out in the brush. Something is watching us. Suddenly, I see movement from the corner of my eye followed by a quick jolt of pain in my shoulder. I go to reach for the wound and retrieve, to my horror, an arrow tipped with black tar. Some type of poison? I look to you with great concern as my legs begin to wobble. Ryder, I believe we have been poised. Before I can finish my sentence, we collapse to the ground. There is only black. I dream of dragons and goblins. The world slips away, and I sleep. Eventually, I open my eyes ever so slightly. We must have been out for days with such a potent dose of whatever that was. Suddenly, my vision focuses, and I see before me a campfire. There, a man and a Semitic goblin sit cooking something in a pot. The goblin mutters out, The contract says you kill this ugly, then you get paid. 
why you keep alive. The man sips his soup and pauses, and then lets out. I will fulfill the contract, but under my own terms. Finally, I see you, Ryder, just before I lose focus again and drift back into sleep. I feel the warm heat of the sun which wakes me. Before I open my eyes, I hear more chatter between the two, and suddenly I am smacked in the face. My eyes open to find my hands bound. I look up and see before me a man of the Orient carrying a backpack which houses the Semitic goblin. As I lay on the ground, the goblin spits on me and cries out, He lived too long already! The oriental man looks out at our surroundings. It is an empty field. No trees or hills can be found in this flat plain which stretches for miles. The goblin snarls and yells once more. We traveled three days out here for what? Finally, the oriental man replies. This here will be a good spot. He takes off the backpack carrying the goblin and begins unbuckling the various tools and contraptions built into his gear. I lie still on the ground. I watch as the goblin makes its way to you, Ryder, and pulls out a small dagger. The goblin spits on you and says, No funny business, or you killed by me. The oriental man finally removes his cloak to reveal his red armor. In an instant, he unsheathes his Jean Madao blade as he walks towards me. Ryder, I suppose this is the end. Not quite the glorious exit befitting a sacred clown I had imagined, but I suppose it will do. Suddenly, he brings the blade up. My eyes look to the sun as I whisper a prayer. And before I can finish, it is brought back down with tremendous force. To my surprise, it was not my head which was severed, but rather the ropes that bound my hands. I look to him as he speaks to me. Get up. The goblin screams out. What you doing? The contract! The contract! The oriental man looks back to the goblin in frustration, saying, Soon. Now shut your mouth and allow me to finish this the way it must be done. I finally stand as he looks back to me, saying, My name is Liu Bei. I am an assassin of the red dragon, the Han. He smiles and holds his hand out to shake mine. I do not move, but remain staring into his eyes. He maintains his smile as he states, I understand you will probably not engage in severity, as you are a western barbarian, but this day is very important for me, so I will attempt to show you grace before I make you non-existent. My eyes remain on his until he looks away, stating, How many centuries now have the Western Imperious dogs hounded my motherland, that which is under the heavens? I have come here because I have been tasked by my state to prevent you from reaching your destination. For I am told, if you manage to wake the sleeping giant, my people's cause will be set back greatly. Something about nihilism and meaning? He laughs as he shakes his head, stating, <laughs> You western dogs are so funny. You should stop asking stupid questions and learn to simply be. Your nations now endlessly debate about nothing. Your populations are quickly becoming something rather different. Do not fear. We do not come to enslave you, the way you enslaved the world with your capitalistic frenzy. No, we shall show you how to truly be, for China is ascendant. You have been eclipsed. I finally speak. We have been poisoned by the Semitic impulse. You too were poisoned, but you do not yet see it. The goblin shrieks. Just kill him already! You killed this ugly now! Liu Bei's eyes turn to mine as he stares. Your jealousy of the Shemite is very interesting. We unrecue savages have learned from them. 
the future of mankind will be enlightened by the philosophy of Marx and liberated by the order of the Chinese York. I gnash my teeth and call out. It was Marxism that led to the deaths of millions of your own kind. They're merely moving from one host to another. Liu Bei begins to pace around me. He finally replies, I am not here to debate. I am here to engage in sacred combat with you. Someone who calls himself the last son of the West. My eyes remain on his as I let out. I am not your enemy. But if you wish for combat, then so be it. Alas, I do not wield a weapon, and so I suppose our battle will be unfortunately quick. Liu Bei smiles as he tosses his Jean Madao blade several yards away. Finally, he lets out. I have come to prove that you have been eclipsed. For in my career as an assassin, I have far too often killed from the shadows. I have injured men before they even knew they were in danger. But here must be different. It is here in this sacred combat where I will show the world that the Aryan is below the Hun. I will become the Earth's champion. Not with tricks or subterfuge, but with sheer determination and skill. I have brought you out here so that there will be no hiding, no high ground to give one an advantage, no rivers to escape through. Just this battlefield that has long awaited us. As soon as I pull my fists up to prepare my stance, Liu Bei is already in the air. In an instant, his foot lands directly on my chest, sending me flying back. Blast! I am but a rogue. Where is my dagger? What do I know of unarmed combat? I quickly return to my feet and realize that he has disappeared completely. I look around, left, and right. When out of nowhere his fist lands directly into my guts from below, my blood spills out onto the earth as if the dirt were a painter's canvas, and I fall back barely catching myself. He continues his assault, landing blow after blow. Suddenly, I am thrown once more to the ground. Liu Bei begins laughing. <laughs> this is the rest hope of your kind. This is what we have so long feared. Do you know of Sun Tzu's art of war? No, surely you mustn't. Allow me to give you proper schooling, Arian. I limp back onto my feet. Blood pouring from my nose. A few of my ribs are definitely cracked, but it's nothing that nymphs can't heal. Liu Bei tilts his head to the side as he begins again. Lesson one, do not repeat the tactics which have gained you one victory, but let your methods be regulated by the infinite variety of circumstances. He changes his stance and begins pummeling my face with his wrists and elbows. All I can do is attempt to shield my body from the onslaught of blows. Then suddenly, Liu Bei stops for the offensive. I lower my arms just in time to see him change his stance once more. Before I can even throw a punch, he lands a spinning kick across my jaw, sending me flying several yards. I lay on the ground crawling. To where, I do not know. Before the full weight of Liu Bei's boot comes crashing down on my arm. He studies my red, white, and blue bandana wrapped around my wrist and then bends down and removes it from my possession. He looks over the flag of my fatherland and states, You aren't even trying. I desire from you sacred combat. I require glory, just as any man does. And you would deny it to me here on my special day. Perhaps we must get a rise out of you. Rasen too. Begin by seizing something which your opponent holds dear, then he will be amenable to your will. He rips my red, white, and blue in two. The hate begins to grow. The wild man begins to manifest. This Liu Bei is very different than I. In my youth, I chased girls before I chased the sun. I am but a rogue who has long lurked in the shadows, relying on my guile and cunning. I am no brawler only ever engaging in pub fights once or thrice. This Liu Bei of the Red Dragon has from his very youth been forged into a weapon of the Han. 
He has been trained in multiple forms of martial arts and raised on a diet of steroids and biogenetic engineering since childhood. He is among the first of the Chinese overmen. He has never known freedom, as I have known it. Even in my decaying West, I remember a freedom undreamt of in man's history. But this Liu Bei has only known order. Order manifests like a crystal, harnessing the power of light, a focused energy which can bring about mass development or destruction. The centralized power of order can be put to use for good or evil, for beauty or ugliness, for the knowing or the unknowing. Tell me, writer, do the communists create goodness and beauty? I charge at him and he quickly dodges. Every punch I throw meets only the air, and each one is returned in kind with several strikes to my face. I can barely see out of my left eye, as it is nearly swollen shut. I walk aimlessly from left to right, punching into the wind. The obey begins to laugh. I think of my weakness. I think of that little girl's face from the graveyard. And the hate holds back the pain. In his overconfidence, he has left himself open. I have one shot. The hate erupts into chaos, and the chaos is unleashed as I throw everything into a single punch. He only realizes the danger after I have made contact. Liu Bei flies through the air and crashes to the ground, dazed. Now is the time to act. Now is the time to harness the hate, to let go and become the berserker. I charge him, drunk on fury, landing blow after blow, my body filled equally with love and hatred. Just as I'm about to land my final strike, he suddenly regains his composure and catches my fist in his own, throwing me yards away onto the soil. This time, I land on my feet. Liu Bei looks up at me in amazement. His hand explores his face as he realizes that he can bleed. I call out to him. The Han and the Aryan don't have to be enemies. I wish only to unite the Aryan tribes. We must work together to aid beings knowing. He spits out blood to the ground and cries out, When you white men came, you aided drug traffickers. You poisoned my people. You enslaved large swaths of humanity's population with your coronialism. You are barbarians. I give no pause and reply, Man is a wolf to man. Great acts of unkindness run deep in all of our histories. Or have you forgotten the corpses that rest in your great wall? You are not my enemy, Liu Bei. You are only another aspect of being. We are both capable of the knowing. Liu Bei charges me with deadly agility, finally launching himself into a flying kick which breaks several of my ribs. I kiss the earth once more. I am beginning to break down. Hate alone cannot keep a heart beating. I cannot realistically win this fight. Even if I may injure him, he ultimately will win. I look to the sun above and smile. Strange how the satisfaction lingers. However, giving up completely seems a little unbecoming of a sacred clown. I am about to push myself up off the ground, when suddenly the Semitic goblin jumps on my back, flailing its dagger around dangerously close to my neck. I roll a